so good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. For our uh, inaugural uh, event of our conference series, we're going to have we're uh, happy to have 23 presentations, about 50 people in person, 50 people online. So, um, hello to everybody online. Uh, we won't be hearing from them, but they'll be uh, be able to listen in. Um, I'd like to acknowledge our generous funding from the National Institute of uh, Aging through an R13 conference grant and the uh, CD CDHA Center grant, as well as coal competition funds from the La Follette School of Public Affairs. And in combination, those funding streams keep the event free. There's no conference uh, fee um, and set up all the infrastructure to circulate the videos and the, and the uh, live stream and allow um, hopefully most of you can come here for free. You get travel, you get travel reimbursements, everything. So we like to, uh, we made all that investment to keep this accessible, especially to junior scholars. I'd like to thank our co-organizers who are going to serve as chairs throughout. Um, Lauren, James, and Q will introduce themselves if they come up, but they'll be chairing sessions. Um, two quick administrative things. Uh, your Wi-Fi is the UWNet. I've been told that for non-UW people, you'll have to take a second to figure out where the guest login is. So just, I've been told it is definitely there and it trips up most people. So just like, you know, persevere and find on the UWNet page when it pops up, there is a guest login. So just, I wanna underline that because it comes up every event where um, it's hard to actually do this, but it is there. Um, gender neutral restrooms are on the third floor. We're on the second floor right now of the, of the Union Terrace. The final thanks, uh, Mary Lynn and Grace have just been exceptional in setting all this up. I want to thank them for um, all the efforts on the logistics, and they were also in charge of the weather, so let's thank them for that. <laughs> so this is a series, and we decided that each series is going to have a bit of a theme, and this one is an introduction to the All of Us data. We think this is going to take our uh, discipline by storm in the way that UK Biobank did several years ago and really be a, a huge opportunity for us who are interested in social genomics to take advantage of this new data. And for that reason, we're, we're just so pleased to have one of the local leaders of All of Us here, Dorothy Edwards, who's going to give our introductory distinguished speaker lecture. Um, so all of us, I've been told, this is not uh, from Dorothy or from Dr. Edwards, it's billed as the largest health database ever. I'm sure it's going to have some competition across the world for that, but that's, that's the goal. It's one of the largest projects ever supported by the NIH, and it has a particular focus on, on um, underrepresented groups who've been traditionally upper, underrepresented in biomedical research. So I think it's going to have so much opportunity to for for our interests and for many other disciplinary interests. Uh, UW is one of the ten sites in the country that's going to, in combination, you know, bring a million people into this data set over time. So it's very exciting. Uh, Dr. Edwards is the co-PI at. At UW, uh, she's the Vilas Distinguished Achievement Professor, um, both in the School of Medicine and in the School of Education, and the Faculty Director of the UW Collaborative Center for Health Equity. Um, she's she also might might have been the uh, participant number one in Madison, for number two. Uh, so she's going to come uh, now give a introductory talk about the local efforts and in inviting us to use the all of us data. So please uh, join me in welcoming her to the stage. I tried to be participant one, number one, and someone beat me to it. So um, I am so honored to be here today and to be your first speaker. It's really a nice position because you can't compare me to anyone. And I want to welcome all of our out-of-town uh, participants to Madison. We're a wonderful university, and this is a wonderful place, but we're particularly enriched by the people who come and share their wisdom and their research with us. And so welcome to all of you. And um, I am very excited. And hopefully I can advance the slides to talk to you about the All of Us Research Program. So the All of Us Research Program is, as Jason said, one of the largest initiatives ever taken by the National Institutes of Health. And it came together in a really, really interesting way. I'm going to give you a little bit of social history here, too. So um, as we all know, Francis Collins uh, sequenced the human genome. And, and when he became director of the NIH, his goal was to really advance precision medicine. He wanted the advances of what the genome, the information the genome holds 
to actually have an impact on the health and well-being of individuals in their everyday lives. That's, that's a really big goal when you think about it, going from this very important scientific discovery to helping me manage my hypertension, right? And so he had this vision, and the original funding, the beginning of the All of Us program, actually came out of his director's fund. Now, there's another piece of it that doesn't get discussed as often, and that's that President Obama and the Affordable Care Act in, embedded in the Affordable Care Act, first of all, that electronic, that we had to move to electronic health records and that those records had to be portable and those records had to be available for precision medicine research. And interestingly enough, Joe Handelsman, who is the director of our Wisconsin Discovery Institute, was President Obama's scientific uh, advisor. And she wrote, our UW person, wrote the original draft of the combination of the information in the Affordable Care Act with funding for all of us, together with uh, Francis Collins' dream of making the, the human genome uh, accessible in everyday life. So it's really interesting. I mean, from a social science perspective, right? Because I'm a psychologist. It's a really interesting merger of basic biological science and social determinants of health. Right? So that's the origins of this program. So the mission of all of us, as, we said, as I said, is to really accelerate health research and medical breakthroughs, which allow individualized prevention, treatment, and care for everyone. And the design of the program was really different. So many of us, many of you, are funded by traditional NIH grants. You know, we get R21s or R01s or we're in, in program projects. But those are framed very differently. The All of Us mechanism is funded by something called an OT mechanism. Have you ever heard of an OT? It means other, <laughs> and it's a huge amount of money, but it came with conditions. Those conditions were that it had, there had to be partnerships, and we had to see participants as partners. It had to be diverse. We had to actually meet the standards set by Bernadine Healy in 1993 of generalizable data. 1993 is when that was codified into US law. Think about how many projects we've worked on um, from 1993 forward that actually are not representative of the population as a whole. And I know that's one of the missions of the center here is generalizability, but I just want you to keep that in mind because this is one of the greatest values. And it was to change the research ecosystem by combining communities, researchers, and funders together in a common goal. So that's our mission. The core values is that participation is open to all. Anyone right now over the age of 18, if you're not incarcerated, in the United States is eligible to participate. The participants are our partners, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. Trust is earned through transparency. Participants have access to their data, including their genomic information. The data is broadly available for research purposes without charge. Security and privacy are of, of very important, and the program must be a catalyst for change in research. So, it's really designed to support precision medicine, and I frankly didn't know much about precision medicine when I started. I'm an engagement person. <laughs> My area of expertise is actually recruitment and retention of African Americans in biomedical research. And I got pulled in to this project, actually to create a community engagement strategy and a recruitment strategy. And then um, uh, my, my PI at the medical school at, the, at, our, at our Institute for Clinical and Translational Re Research retired. And I defaulted into the site PI role. It was a very non-traditional way of doing things. And my, my co-PI, Dr. Beth Burnside, is a radiologist, and she actually studies breast cancer and polygenic risk factors in breast cancer. So she's the precision medicine person. I'm the community person. But um, precision medicine is obviously a way of personalizing healthcare so that we take into account individual variability, lifestyles, socioeconomic status, environment, biology and putting it all together to make sure the care that somebody receives is actually the best care possible for them as an individual. And we have, within the All of Us data set, measures of all these factors. So why now? How, how could this program come about? Well, first of all, it's, it's a digital-based enrollment program, which is a challenge for some communities. But we have the technology to be able to collect a lot of data we know that people are interested in their health and track and share their data. For example, um, people are sharing um, 
whether you know you think about it, if you're sharing your Fitbit data with anybody, if you belong to Apple Health, you're sharing your data. So the technology is available for large scale sharing of information. And we have we're now at the point where the human genome is deciphered and we can really begin to to move those those scientific advances forward. So we need the all of us program because there's been no way of pulling all this data together. It's very expensive. It's really complicated. It requires a huge infrastructure. And um, we don't want the advantages of precision medicine only to be available to, for those of us who have really, really high-end insurance policies or live in a community like Madison where we have access to physicians and scientists who can actually provide the data that we need. And I don't need to tell all of you, but uh, so many people in the United States, so many different groups are underrepresented. And I'm not just talking about race and ethnicity. I'm talking about LGBTQ communities. I'm talking about people with disabilities. I'm talking about people in rural communities. So the decision was made that this particular project had to be fully inclusive. And we know that there's, it takes a long time from discovery to implementation. I think the average hasn't changed in the last 20 years. It takes about 18 years to go from a discovery that ha that's actionable to actually seeing that implemented in practice. So we wanted healthcare providers to be able to operationalize the findings and move them into care faster. And we wanted biomedical researchers and social sciences researchers to have the data that they needed in an accessible way to do their work and to move all of these areas forward. So the All of Us program was really designed from the very beginning to catalyze change in the research enterprise, to democratize data, to be fully inclusive, to force investigators at the peril of losing their funding to be inclusive. And this is where the OT mechanism is really important. Our program officer for UW, for the Wisconsin Consortium, could call tomorrow and say, you know, I've been looking at your numbers. You're not, you're not enrolling the underrepresented groups in the way you said you've been. We're going to move your money to Arizona. She could say that tomorrow. And by next week, she would move the money to Arizona. I mean, it's happened within the program. So they're really serious about this inclusion part of it. Um, for researchers, it's been a challenge to really move to digital engagement strategies. We have some groups in Madison. We, we, um, I have staff that are working out of the Meadow Ridge Library in the south part of Madison. It can take two hours sitting side by side with someone who's not computer literate to go through the enrollment process to, to explain the consent. The consent is all like is a video. It's actually really cool. If you if you haven't seen it, I would encourage you whether you want to enroll in all of us or not to go through that consent process just to see how it's done because it changes our 25 page consent forms into a video that's very, very straightforward, uses icons and images rather than words. But for someone who's not computer literate, it can be a bit of a challenge. Um, we uh, want to be able to bring in investigators from community scientists all the way up to individuals like you and to using the data. We want to uh, build a network of partners so that you can collaborate across the country, across the world with the data. And um, so it's a democratization process from enrollment all the way through the investigators. So the kinds of questions, and, and um, these questions are actually starting to be answered. So this is an old slide from 2020. But the, we, were, we were trying to explain to people, what could you do with these data? You know, um, what might slow dementia? That's an area of research that I do. You know, what are the risk factors? What does physical activity look like? How does nutrition affect um, cognitive impairment? Um, how do we develop better measures of you know, assessing pain, chronic pain, and finding better ways of addressing chronic pain? What are the environmental exposures of dairy workers in Wisconsin? And why do they have more prostate cancer and uh, more esophageal cancer, for example? So, um, so we get information on exposures. And what are the sustainable in interventions that actually drive health equity? The whole goal is health equity. How are we going to change the environment where we have haves and have nots? So the innovative aspects, as I've said before, is that um, we need to recruit a million people. And when we signed up for this, it's like, 
yeah, sure, we can recruit 100,000 people in Wisconsin, no problem, four sites. Um, we can do that over five years. Well, not quite, but um, uh, we're committed and we meet every week with the NIH nationally to achieve the goal. And we're at 657,000, I think, right now. So we're actually making great progress. But the goal was to recruit a million people. The feeling was that we needed to have at least a million people in the data set for these data to be fully operational. And we need to keep them in the data set because the value is the longitudinal access to their electronic health records. That the data needed to be very diverse as it was collected longitudinally. So clinical, environmental, genetic, behavioral, socioeconomic. And so this is one of the first times for NIH to actually incorporate social determinants into the base data, not as an add-on, but into the base data. It needed to um, really partner with participants including governance, including asking them to help them co-design um, what we do and how we do it, provide input into the science, and to get their data back. Um, and we wanted it to be broadly accessible to the public, so anyone can go into the workbench and use the data, as long as you know R or Python. <laughs> you know, so, so it's a good idea. They're still working on the analytic tools. So the promise for participants, and because I do, I'm on the recruitment side of it, and we've recruited about 9,000 people from our group here in Madison. So, you know, we haven't gotten to the 25,000, but um, it, it was, it took a while to get launched. Um, it was a really the opportunity um, to improve the health of future generations. So if, if any of you who've worked on engagement and recruitment strategy, strategies, particularly in underrepresented groups. This ability to improve the health of the community and future generations is the primary reason why people sign up for research. It's altruism that drives research participation, um, particularly when the data and the information can be seen as coming back to the community that they're in. Um, that the ability to learn about their own health through the return of results, um, the uh, the demonstration that communities are included, we have very clear requirements for community advisory boards, participant advisory boards. So the participants really are invite, enrolled in the governance of the project. A chance to learn about additional research opportunities for ancillary studies, and those are just now being launched. The choice to meet other people. We, we regularly bring our participants together if they to, to share information, to ask questions of investigators. And, um, uh, we want a long-term relationship. This is not a one-off kind of thing. So again, we want to keep people involved for at least 10 years. For any of those of you who do <coughs> excuse me, longitudinal research, you know that retention is just as important. We talk a lot about recruitment. We don't talk so much about retention, but retention is even more important because your baseline data is not very helpful if you don't have longitudinal follow-up. For the researchers, because you're all researchers, it's really an opportunity to save time and resources. How often do you have the opportunity to work with a fully uh, curated data set that's this big and this rich, that doesn't cost you anything, um, that has the diversity in the, um, in the data themselves? Um, the, the workbench has robust computing and analytic tools in, a, tools in a secure environment. So you can do machine learning, you can do lots and lots of things with the analytic tools that are in, in the portal. You have um, participants who are willing to participate in ancillary studies, and you can share your information and analyses in this common workspace. And um, there are pilot funds available so that you can actually get some funding to do your own explorations of the data. So right now, our protocol looks like this. Um, we're recruiting anybody over the age of 18, and um, the consent, as I said, is online. It includes an authorization to share their elec your electronic health record, and a consent. Individuals can decide whether they want or they don't want to get their own DNA results back. Uh, there are a series of surveys that they fill out about uh, health, lifestyle, healthcare access, um, healthcare utilization, family history, social determinants of health. And there's a new survey about pediatric um, participation. We're about to start enrolling children next year, but there's a pediatric participation survey that was just launched a, a couple of weeks ago. There are physical measurements. We ask people to come in and do height, weight, um, blood pressure, 
Um, they provide biosamples, blood or saliva, urine, and those samples are stored at the Mayo Clinic in our biobank. And then um, a smaller percentage of the individuals share information from Fitbits, Apple Watches, and wearables. So how we do this? So we, we were incentivized to focus on underrepresented groups. In other words, a, a minimum of 40% of our sample had to be from underrepresented groups, broadly defined using the broad NIH definition. Um, we had to work with federally qualified health centers to make sure that the safety net health centers were, in, were involved and we had data coming from them. And that was actually really complicated because many of them have net made as much progress in electronic health records. They had their own internal electronic health record that was not shareable. And that's, that's been a bit of a complication, but HRSA has provided additional funding to support that. We had to um, create uh, direct volunteer partners, and that's groups like Walgreens, CVS, so that for people who are not living in places where one of these large recruitment er groups was located, someone could still volunteer. We had to grow a network of national and community partners. We had to develop and actually execute plans for special population engagements. And we had to build this user-centered design culture by really listening carefully to all of the constituents, to the scientists, to the people in the communities, to our research, um, our research staff. And I think that the program has done a pretty good job of that. So the biggest question, the biggest barrier to enrollment is what? Privacy. Particularly among people who are, you know, very well educated saying, I don't know, you know, I, you know. I did that UW cybersecurity course. I know what breaches happened at the Social Security Administration. So cybersecurity. So um, the issues of privacy and security were actually foundational to the design of our workbench. So it's obviously guided by privacy, trust, and data security principles. Our, our data warehouse, which is um, at Vanderbilt, uses the same software and the same protections that the National Security Agency uses. So we're up there with the spies. Uh, the data are very uses very complicated encryption and then recombination um, algorithms. Investigators, the, the only requirement for you to use the database is to go through the code of conduct training and, and the, the, the intensity of the training goes up depending on which level of data you're using. So if I'm only interested in social demographic data, the, what I have to do as, a, as an investigator using the data is much less complicated than someone using genomic data and actually uh, downloading whole genome sequences. We are protected by certificates of confidentiality, and we're committed to transparency in the event of a data breach. And so far, there have been no data breaches, which is good. But um, the system is constantly being challenged. There's a group of hackers that work for all of us constantly trying to get into the system to see if, if uh, as the system evolves and we collect more data and we have data coming from more sources, whether there's any possibility of a breach. So I'm, as a participant, and I'm pretty careful about what I participate in, um, I think that our data are as safe as they possibly can be. So this is how the whole thing works. We have a data and research center, the DRC, that's at Vanderbilt University. The biobank is at the Mayo Clinic. Um, we have a whole participant uh, technology system center that tracks our participants. So my, the people we enroll here are not my participants. They're all of us participants. And so that's managed centrally. We have genomic partners who are actually doing the genomic analyses, the Broad Institute, Baylor, other partners. We have um, a participant center that works with some of our direct volunteer groups. We have health provider that's what we are. We're considered a health provider organization. And we have a community engagement and communications network. And we also have genetic counseling that was added by a company called Color. So um, this is what our participants actually get back. They get back genetic ancestry, some genetic traits, kind of like the 23andMe. Do you like cilantro? Do you have dry or wet earwax? Can you roll your tongue? Medicine and your DNA, the pharmacogenomics are actually probably the most valuable information that people get back. And then their hereditary disease risk using the 59 um, actionable uh, genomic findings. 
these are the social, this is what you're really interested in, right? <laughs> this is why you're here. So these are the social determinants that are currently being measured. Um, neighborhoods, perceived neighborhood safety, neighborhood environment, social support, discrimin perceived discrimination, food security, um, healthcare, dis perceived healthcare discrimination, loneliness, stress, housing. A pretty, pretty robust group of variables, I think, together with all the other geographic um, and personal information. Um, as I said, genetic ancestry um, is really valuable. I found out that my mother had been lying to me all along. It was the funniest thing. So I, I just a personal note, I never wanted to enroll in 23andMe, okay? I just didn't trust them. Because as an investigator doing Alzheimer's research, I've actually tried to, the uh, NIA and the Alzheimer's Association have been working with 23andMe to get access to their data. So I, I just don't trust them, okay? That, that's just my personal thing. Um, so I didn't have any information about my genetic background. And my mother, probably more about me than you want to know, but my mother is very Irish Catholic, okay? Very hardcore. St. Patrick's Day is the holy day of obligation kind of Catholic, okay? It turns out I'm 78% Ashkenazi Jew. <laughs> and that made me feel good because I actually converted. But <laughs> my mother passed away and I didn't know any of this. I mean, it was a real surprise when I got my genetic results and it's like, holy cow, no wonder I felt this way all my life. I, Catholic preschool, primary school, high school, I went to a Jesuit college. So all the way through, and then I found my real self. So anyway, sometimes you never know what you're gonna get, but um, you get your genetic, your ancestry is equivalent to what you would get from 23andMe. And then the traits, this was really the teaser for people to keep them engaged until the real genomic analyses could be done. These are the hereditary disease risk genes, the 59 genes that all of us looks at. And um, now an investigator going into the workbench can look at the full genome sequencing. They do long sequences on a, a subsample. So you're not limited to these 59 genes. These are just the, this is just the information that's returned to individuals um, because these are all actionable conditions. And there is, um, there is a resource for genetic counseling for anyone who gets their results back. And because these are research findings, um, if someone has an actionable finding, all of us will actually pay for the, the clinical uh, genomic evaluation. And that came about, interestingly enough, because a group of the, at one of our early meetings, a group of physicians associated with the Federally Qualified Health Center said, you're, making, you're asking us to enroll patients, and you're telling us that they're going to get their genomic results back. We don't have the money to confirm these results. It's not right. And you shouldn't ask us to participate if our patients don't have access to the same information as everybody else. So they went back and sort of retooled and then set aside the funding to do the confirmatory um, testing. Um, we find that the pharmacogenomic results are actually, for people who have gotten their results back, are, are much, much more useful because almost everybody will have a, a genome, a, a drug gene interaction. And I can then, just sharing my own results, I found out, so when I go to the dentist, it takes a huge amount of Novocaine to numb me based on my body weight. And it turns out that I actually am a fast metabolizer of certain kinds of drugs. And there's certain chemotherapy agents that would not work for me. Um, and there's certain, um, any hypertensives that won't work for me. I was really shocked to see this in my report. So you actually do get uh, practical information back. But we found in working with the people who are getting their genomic results back that they're actually much more excited about the pharmacogenomic results because most people are not going to have a finding um, for the genetic risk factors. About 5,000 people a week now are getting their genetic results back. Um, they really, the return of results has really accelerated now that the platforms are established. So what can you do with these data? Well, you can look at estimates of risk. You can um, look at pharmacogenomics. You can find um, biologic signals. You can look at health disparities by geography 
by uh, uh, underrepresented group, combinations of factors. Um, you can look at some of the data from the mobile health technologies in terms of physical activity. There's a huge uh, diet nutrition study that's just been launched that will um, include microbiome samples. Um, you can um, use the data to go back to a community to say, this is what we found, and how can we change the, these outcomes? And um, they're talking about trials of targeted therapies that has not yet developed. So this is the national um, picture. You know, we're here in the All of Us Wisconsin uh, program. Our, our program includes UW-Madison, the Medical College of Wisconsin, the Marshfield Clinic, and the Gunderson Healthcare System. They're on what they call the West Coast of Wisconsin. They're up, um, you know, in, uh, on the border of Minnesota. Um, there are three groups in, in Illinois, University of Chicago, University of Illinois, Chicago, and Northwestern. Um, the Deep South uh, Coalition, which is really um, Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana. Southeast is Georgia, Florida. There are three groups in New York, a group in New England. The TAC group, the Trans-American Precision Medicine, goes all the way from Michigan through northern Wisconsin and Minnesota. Um, Arizona, Banner Health has really done a great job, particularly with Hispanic communities. And then uh, groups of four universities in California. So this is, this, is the, this is what we have. This is as of this week. I checked last night. Um, so we have 651,439 participants in some who have consented or in some state of enrollment. We have 453,000 people who have completed all of their enrollment. 80, almost 81% are from an underrepresented group. This is really striking. 46% um, are from racial and ethnic minority groups. And we have 533 institutions currently using the data. Um, UW was one of the first to register. We have um, 520, 5,200 workplaces. That's when you go into the workbench and you create a, a data notebook. So, and we have 5,700 investigators. And we'd like each one of you to join us in doing that. These are all, this is what it takes. So remember, we were told that we had to create a national coalition and create partners. So this is a, it's a huge enterprise, um, including, um, so they just recently added the university, uh, you know, in Puerto Rico, the University of Puerto Rico. So you're going to, we've seen over the five years, we're actually in year five of our project going in for a competitive renewal that um, as the project's gone on, the number of groups participating has grown, the access to other underrepresented groups has grown. And um, it, it, it takes a lot to do this, but I think it's, it's really successful. Uh, COVID really set the program back. I'll tell you, it's really hard to do this kind of engagement, which requires, in, in the case of um, particularly racial and ethnic minority communities or other underrepresented groups, individuals with disability, for example, you, you need a lot of face-to-face -face contact. I think the, the initial assumption, this is, this is me as a social scientist, as a member of this project from the very beginning, I think the people at NIH who designed it knew a lot about genomics, knew a lot about data, knew a lot conceptually about community partnerships, but it actually never recruited a person, <laughs> you know? And so the assumption is that if I told you that this is a really cool project and you really, really want to do it, that you would automatically sign up. And that's true for early adopters, about 10% of our sample, or people say, oh, that sounds like a wonderful idea. How can I do it? But you know, people in, in, in communities, particularly communities that have not had much contact with investigators are appropriately leery of engagement. So it takes a year, maybe, of going out and talking to people, showing them data, sponsoring events, answering questions, showing that we have diverse staff, that they have access to the information. We're very, very transparent. And we get people to enroll. We, but it takes time. So there's been a lag in enrollment, particularly from the underrepresented groups that the program was designed to recruit. And then COVID. You know, we were out of the field for almost two years. And, and as many of you know, some uh, community groups are just now, I mean, in the last month or so, 
beginning to think about uh, community events again, because their communities were hit very, very hard by COVID and um, community members didn't want risk. So we found, actually, we learned a lot about, you know, Facebook live presentations that you can actually do recruitment with underrepresented groups um, through virtual engagement, but it's slow. So the overall enrollment has slowed, but it's beginning to pick up. And I think we're gonna see it accelerate over the next year. So uh, I wanna point out, so this guy in the middle holding up the Public Service Recognition Week is Josh Denny. He's our All of Us PI. He was here in Madison about a month ago. And um, that's his son. And his son has neurofibromatosis. And they're using the All of Us data to look at the neurofibromatosis gene. So his lab is researching the problem of his son with his data, which is pretty cool. Um, and this is our UW team. And so I'm ready to answer any questions you might have about this data resource, which is. Because we're both uh, live streaming, we have a mic here for questions. Oh, great. I know it's early, but come on, you must have questions. What's the, uh, the scope of a research that's uh, within the bounds of what, uh, what we can do with all of us? Because I applied for it, but they said it has to be uniquely health research. Do we mean like really understanding the etiology of, and the biology of disease, or it's like social genomic? Anything. How, how broad is it? It's very broad. In other words, um, one of the advantages, that's a great question. One of the advantages of the All of Us data set is that it goes all the way from um, geographical, social, individual dem demographic information to the health information. You may not want to touch the genomic information. You may be interested in who participates. You, you may be a recruitment science person and you want to know what are the characteristics of people, particularly people from underrepresented groups who are willing to sign up for uh, a biomedical research project um, of this type. So you might actually s study, you know, because we know how people were recruited and when. So you could do a recruitment science project, which would be really wonderful. Or you could be interested in a particular allele in a particular gene, and and but want to know whether individuals are have certain social demographic characteristics. So there is no limit. In other words, one of the interesting things about this is this is a disease agnostic, question agnostic database. It is available to you, collectively, to answer your questions. Um, so there are no limits. Sure. The, the comment, does it always have to pertain to health in some no. direct or indirect way, or we can ask more? You can ask any question. The only, the, the most interesting thing about it is, so when you go into, um, we go into the workbench, um, and it's research at allofus.org, you go into the workbench, you can, you can actually look at the data dictionary, and what you do to use it is you pose a question, and that question gets posted, and a description of, you know, your information is added to it. So here, here's the reason I'm asking this question. You know, here's the background. Here's the question. Here's who's doing it. And we have high school students and we have, you know, uh, college professors doing it. Um, the one thing that everyone um, agrees to in using the data is that you can be questioned on the ethics of the question that you're asking. So a participant, we have participants who look regularly at the 5,700 questions that have been posed. And they can actually call for an ethics review of a question. And this is one of the other unique factors in addition to giving people their own data. They get to question the use of their data. And there's been a big flap about whether commercial entities will be able to use these data. So I have African-American participants on our participant advisory board here. You say, I'm really good with anybody using it, but don't, don't let a pharmaceutical company use these data. And we, we can't. You know, we can't say that. Ooh. So anyway, another question? I hope I answered. Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, Lauren Schmitz, University of Wisconsin, Madison. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first is uh, plans to collect other types of omics data like epigenetics or metabolomics. Um, and my second, especially since it's your area of research is to hear more about how you actually go about engaging these communities. Are you 
going and knocking on doors? Like, how do you target areas? Is that a good question. sort of population representative way? Um, and then, you know, are you going, yeah, knocking on doors, talking to people that way? Um, and then do they have to come in to UW to get profiled? Great questions. Or do they just go to CVS or Walgreens or, yeah? Okay, so um, I can answer the second question better than the first. Um, uh, yes, I believe that all sorts of omics are possible within this, but uh, I'd have to get you in touch with um, the people who actually do the omics and the precision um, medicine. In terms of engagement, uh, my area is engagement. So he, here in, in Madison and also in Milwaukee, we have a team in Milwaukee on the ground in Milwaukee. Here in Madison, I've been doing recruitment in, Ma in Madison for my own research for the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center and through my Center for Health Equity. So we had some community partners. What we did is we pushed a, we pushed a lot of money into the community to support community organizations to first to learn about all of us and then to partner with us to help educate their constituency. So I'm talking, you know, about the Catholic Multicultural Center, um, talking about the Pride Group, um, uh, groups on South Madison. Um, we're a big sponsor of Juneteenth, for example, going on next week. Um, so we we put a huge amount of our resources actually into the community. That was that was first part of our commitment. I did just hire a new community engagement systems person who has knocked on doors, who knocked on every door in Monona, for example, for a water quality study, because we need to constantly be upping our game for engagement. And so, but um, we've really worked with trusted groups in the community, the Urban League, for example. We do community-based enrollment. We enroll at the Meadow Ridge Library, for example. We send a team, a phlebotomist out to the Meadow Ridge Library. We enroll at the Urban League. We have places in the community. We don't expect everybody to come on this campus. As you, you may know, people from Madison may not know this. We see ourselves as a very friendly place. This is a beautiful place. I will tell you that with some of my work with African-American older women, they're afraid. They would only come to this campus as a group. If we sent a bus and brought them in, they'd come with 10, but not with one or two. So we knew that the university location might be a barrier, so we take our work out. We do enrollment in rural communities. Um, we've been in Beaver Dam, Richland Center. So we go out and we do enrollment events um, at churches. So yeah, so our engagement strategy is to be very, very much in the community to invest our resources in our community partners. So it's not you know, a UW white investigator saying, oh, I have a great project for you. Do you want to do my research? I want your blood, I want your urine, I want your data for 10 years. And thank you so much, I'll give you $25, right? So we, we partnered first and recruited. So we, we had a latency period of about two years of engagement before we actually started recruitment, which is about how long it takes. And I think that's why we have the results that we have. Uh, James Lee, also Wisconsin. So I always thought of all of us as a bit of a misnomer because it's like really all of us dot, 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 18 and over. And yeah. I just heard you say that there's going to be some data collection starting on children. And that's not a trivial kind of no, thing to do. It's a totally different ballgame. So I'm curious to hear a little bit more about that. Like, for instance, is are the, the children who are being recruited into the All of Us project actually part of the million person sample? Or is that a totally separate aspect? Of um, they will be part of the million person sample. Although if we get more than a million people, I don't, I don't think the project is gonna stop at a million. It's not like, oh, you hit you know, 9,999 and it's like, it's gone. Um, actually, pediatric, in, the enrollment of children is starting in 2024. And there are some pilot projects now. So um, our uh, PI at the Gunderson Healthcare System is a pediatrician who does research on asthma and lung function in babies. Um, he will do, because he's an experienced investigator, understands the ethics of enrolling children. Everything has to change. I mean, the blood sample sizes, do you do a blood spot, for example? Do you actually draw blood on a baby? No. You know, and so I think what the plan is, is to start um, actually with five-year-olds going up to 18 and then begin to work down towards newborns. Um, you know, we have some great investigators here doing long genome sequences in newborns as part of the, that Badger Alert program where, you know, they're actually putting um, the ability to sequence ba babies' genomics in, in uh, particularly in high-risk neonate nurseries. But the ethics of pediatric recruitment are so much more complicated that we're only now ready in year six to start. But there will be a, a large cohort, and they're trying to avoid the problems in the National Children's Study. 
because many of you know that that was a great idea, but it didn't work particularly well. So we actually have um, NIH investigators, intramural investigators who worked on the children's study who have said, okay, this is what was good, this is what didn't work, and this is how we need to change the process, and that's why it's been a six year. And they talked about pediatric recruitment in year one, um, and um, they, they decided that it needed a longer development period. The other area that um, I, th I think the one thing that uh, um, all of us did not do particularly well was Native American engagement. There was um, an initial start that was very bad. It was not inclusive, didn't include tribal leadership, didn't recognize data sovereignty issues. And so there was initial effort, it was a disaster. They backed off, put together an advisory group, um, which came out with a report. Again, this is very transparent. All this information is available on the website. Came out with a report with some recommendations, and we just got funding this week to engage with, uh, um, with the tribal nations in Wisconsin, the 11 tribal nations, to talk to them about whether they want to hear about all of us. No commitments. The data sovereignty issues, working with Native American communities are really huge, particularly this type of data, and that work is still going on. But we want to hear from them by putting the money into the Great Lakes Tribal Epidemiology Center. So UW is a pass through for the funding to actually begin to just to talk, not, not to recruit. We will not do any recruitment in Wisconsin probably for four or five years. Hi there, Hi. I'm Jen Smith, uh, University of Michigan, and um, I loved your talk, it's very exciting. Um, I work with uh, the University of Michigan Biobank, so Michigan mm -hmm. Genomics Initiative, we have about 100,000 people, and we're really interested in doing recruitment in the Middle East or North African community. We have one of the largest visible communities um, in Detroit. Right. So every event we go to, there's Michigan Genomics Initiative at one table, and all of uh -huh. us at so, the other yeah, table. Yeah, right? we have Henry Ford and, is the yeah. group in Michigan. Yeah. So, so I feel like there's um, some competitive <laughs> spirit there, but I'm wondering if you know of um, other places uh, where biobanks and all of us have kind of, um, you know, worked together and collaboratively to sort of educate communities and and come together for a mutual benefit. That's a really great question. So one of the reasons that Wisconsin was one of the first 10 organizations is because our Marshfield Clinic had one of the first biobanks in the country. The Marshfield Clinic had been collecting data from their patient population. So the Marshfield Clinic is in the middle of the state, rural area. It's like a mini Mayo Clinic. Actually, most people don't know about it, but they had one of the very first patient-based biobanks in the country. And Dr. Murray Brilliant, who was uh, a geneticist at the Marshfield Clinic, was on uh, Francis Collins' original advisory committee to create this. And so we got pulled in in part because of the Marshfield Clinic biobank. What we can now do is dual enrollment. There is an option, finally, about a year ago, to do dual enrollment. So we want to be able to work with SHOW, the Survey of Health of Wisconsin, for example, and enroll people in SHOW, which is really important, uh, random sampling. Um, in Wisconsin and in, in dually enroll. So show might be the first contact and they say, would you be willing to provide a, a, you know, participate in all of us? And we would do it sequentially. So I think you should talk to the Henry Ford people about this dual enrollment option. And I know the University of Michigan is really, you're also, you actually have a specialty focused Alzheimer's study um, looking at Middle Eastern North African populations is the only one in the country. Welcome. Any other questions? Well, I encourage you all to go to the workbench, check it out, do the training, and use the data. Please use the data. It's, I mean, it is phenomenally valuable, fun to work with. Again, if you know R and Python and all those things, or if you have a smart graduate student who can do it for you like I do. I used to code SAS. I forgot how. I can't learn R at this point in my life, I don't think. They tell me I can, but I don't think so. So, so thank you so much. Great opening uh, session. Thank you to Dr. Edwards for that. Just an administrative note. My name is James Lee. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Psychology. I've been a part of the social genomics cluster group uh, since its inception, I think in like 20... 18 or 2019, and it's um, a great pleasure to see uh, how much it's thrived in the, in the time since it started. 
how much the field has changed since the since the time we started as a as a group. Um, it's a it's also a pleasure to see all of you here coming in from out of town. Um, so our first session today will be uh, entitled New Directions in Polygenic Score Analysis. Um, I'm just going to lay out some ground rules since this is our first session of the conference. Um, we'll have three uh, presenters. Each will have 15 minutes presenting on their topics. Uh, and then we're going to reserve questions for the end. So we'll have roughly 10 or 15 minutes at the end of our session to field questions. Um, does that sound good? All right, so I think we're just going to kick things off with our very first speaker, Ravel. Um, thank you, James. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Robel Alamu. I'm a postdoc at UCLA and also hold an affiliate research position at the Broad University of uh, MIT and Harvard. Today, I'll be presenting our work that looks into the relative prediction uh, performance of polygenic indices for complex uh, uh, phenotypes across a wide range of ancestral uh, populations. So this work is in uh, collaboration with uh, Patrick uh, Turley, uh, Aisu Okbe, and Dan Benjamin. So as uh, most of you know, uh, genome-wide association studies have been conducted uh, across a wide range of phenotypes to identify replicable uh, loci that are associated with uh, different uh, traits or disease outcomes. And uh, there have been like thousands of SNPs that have been uh, linked with these uh, phenotypes. And over the years, the sample size for genome -wide association studies has been increasing tremendously, and that has allowed for uh, PGI or PGAs that uh, aggregate the information from thousands of SNPs uh, into a single measure uh, to predict phenotypes uh, to be more uh, predictive. So as you can see here on the, the panel on the right is showing the predictive power of uh, educational uh, attainment. And over the years, uh, the predictive performance of PGIs has been increasing as a function of uh, sample size. Uh, however, most of these genome-wide association studies have been performed using samples uh, coming from European ancestry individuals. Uh, although in recent years there, are, there is some progress in terms of diversifying the genetic data, uh, you, seems to be we have a long way to go. So, uh, given that most of the samples uh, in, in genome-wide association studies are derived from European ancestry individuals, uh, the transferability of PGIs uh, in non-European ancestry individuals has, has been uh, really uh, poor. Uh, and this has a big potential to influence, uh, uh, exacerbate uh, disparities, especially when it comes to the application of these genetic predictors. So the famous study by Martin Ital in 2019 has showed that relative to European ancestry individuals, PGIs that have been trained in European ancestry individuals uh, perform uh, uh, lower, like about 40% lower in South Asian ancestral individuals, about half uh, in East Asian, and nearly 80% uh, lower prediction power in individuals of African ancestry. Another study uh, by Duncan et al. that looked into uh, some uh, phenotypes, looked at and found that the prediction performance is about 64% lower compared to European ancestry individuals uh, for uh, African ancestry uh, individuals. So uh, some recent studies by Privé et al. Uh, in 2022 has shown the decay of these, the predictive power of PGIs, uh, not only across continental ancestries, but even within uh, a given ancestry, even within European ancestry individuals, you see a uh, uh, shrinkage or uh, decay of the predictive power. So uh, as you can see here, so the reference group being Europe, uh, UK individuals within the UKB, uh, you see that the prediction power of the PGI in individuals from Poland is about 6% uh, lower. And in individuals from Italy, the prediction power uh, declines by about 14%. Uh, the results in continental ancestries is, is somehow replicated uh, compared to Martin et al. paper. 
So a wide range of factors have been uh, indicated to contribute to the loss of the prediction power of PGIs. So the most popular ones are uh, cross-population differences in uh, allele, allele frequency and also linkage disequilibrium between uh, causal SNPs and the SNPs that are assayed in a genome-wide association study, which we call uh, PGI SNPs. Other factors that have also been showed to influence the prediction power include differences in heritability, gene by environment interaction, causal variant effect sizes, genetic architecture, and also population specific causal SNPs. So, in this study, our main objective is to estimate the relative accuracy of European ancestry trained PGI on non European ancestry population, mainly focusing on complex behavioral traits. And the second one is to look into the share of the different factors that contribute to the decay of the prediction power of PGIs, like what factors contribute uh, to, those, uh, to that decay. In terms of the scope, we uh, will be looking at three cohorts, the UKB, uh, HRS, and Ad Health. And in terms of the phenotypes, like for instance, for the UKB, so most of the, the results that I will be showing you today is on UKB, but we'll, be, we'll continue to conduct them for the other cohorts as well. So in UKB, we have about 47 phenotypes. So the results you will be seeing are based on 47 phenotypes. So in terms of the first step is to use using the genetic data to identify the ancestry of the respondents. So we'll be using, we, we, we used uh, the PCA-based approach suggested by uh, Yango et al. Uh, in terms of computing the PGIs, we use the Bayesian-based approach, which is called ACE-BASE-R. So to estimate the relative prediction accuracy of the PGI, we'll be taking the ratio of the incremental R-square. And the next step of our objective is basically to understanding, so what explains the, 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 the drop in the prediction power. We implement a slight modification of the uh, theoretical model that has been suggested by Wang et al to estimate the contribution of the different factors. So this uh, theoretical model sort of uh, defines relative accuracy as a function of LD, minor R frequency, and heritability. So here's a workflow that uh, simplifies uh, the step that we will be following. So first is we'll, be, we'll have a discovery state. This discovery state includes all European ancestry individuals, excluding a validation state. So for instance, when you think about UKB, so we'll be excluding uh, part partitions, so the, excluding a partition, the third partition of UKB individuals, because that's used as a validation set. So we'll be running uh, GWASs and, and get the betas, and uh, we'll be uh, looking at target uh, set that includes uh, the third partition in terms of UKB, uh, which is UKB3, and also all non European ancestry individuals are part of the target set. And we'll be using the betas uh, to compute uh, the PGIs using SBSR. And next would be to compute the incremental R square, which is uh, partialing out the effects of a wide range of covariates and PCs. And then we take the ratio of the incremental R square to compute the observed relative accuracy. So SBSR is a choice uh, 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 of, of, of a method of choice because it has been shown to uh, uh, improve the prediction ac accuracy relative to comparable methods. So let me show uh, some results here. So, so the chart that you see, the violin plot that you see here, shows the relative uh, PGI prediction accuracy uh, as averaged around uh, all of the 47 phenotypes. And you can clearly see that there is this trend where you have the loss of the accuracy is the highest in individuals from African ancestry descent, followed by East Asian and uh, South Asian. So the dot that you see on the right is basically the reference group, which is European ancestry individuals. So relative to European ancestry individuals, you clearly see the values that you see on the top are the average uh, relative accuracy. So about 20% on average in African ancestry, 30% in East Asian, and around 50% in South Asia. So the most related work, which I was talking about, Martin et al., 
basically, for the most part, we, we replicate what, what has been uh, uh, produced by, by Martin Ital. But Martin Ital's paper looked at 17 pheno uh, phenotypes. So we have much more phenotypes. And most of the phenotypes were looked at by Martin Ital is uh, looking to like anthropometric and mostly blood traits. So you clearly see the more shrinkage or decay of the prediction power now that we have a wide range of phenotypes. As you can see here, about 60% for South Asia and about 50% for East Asian and 22%. So especially in uh, South Asian and East Asian individuals, you see substantial drop now that we have much more phenotypes. So let's uh, unpack this aggregate value in terms of the prediction power. So we have a wide range of uh, uh, phenotype categories. So as you can see, first, we have anthropometric phenotypes. This includes two phenotypes. One is the uh, height and the other is the BMI. So we, we, we just have dot here. As you can see here, relative to the gray dot, which is European ancestry, so you see substantially lower uh, drop in, in the prediction power among African, East Asian, relatively better in South Asian individuals. For uh, phenotypes that are cardio uh, uh, metabolic, uh, we also see uh, a trend where you have substantially lower uh, prediction power among African ancestry, uh, but comparable between East Asian and South Asian. And these values somehow are closer to one that has been reported by Martin Ital, which actually looked at these phenotypes, like the cardio metabolic phenotypes. So we sort of replicate this, but when you add other groups, you see uh, slightly different patterns. And this includes a wide range of health indicators. Here as well, you see the prediction power in African ancestry individuals is substantially lower, and that in, in East Asia and in South Asia are, are comparable. Uh, and the other group that phenotype group that we looked at is uh, cognition. So this includes educational uh, attainment and cognitive performance. So these are two phenotypes. And you can see here that the prediction power in African ancestry is East Asians is really low uh, and uh, slightly better uh, prediction power in uh, South Asian individuals. The next group includes uh, uh, personality traits and psych psychiatric conditions. Uh, here also, the prediction power for South Asians sort of stood, stood out and, and sort of have better prediction power, but in East Asians and in African ancestry individuals, comparable, uh, comparably low prediction power. So the next one looks at uh, substance use that to do with like cannabis use or ever smoker or things like that. So this also clearly shows the prediction power is much, much better in South Asia relative to the other groups. In terms of uh, fertility traits, so, uh, so this includes the number of children ever born and things like that. So uh, for those phenotypes, you see a clear distinction in terms of the relative prediction, prediction power of the PGIs. Uh, in South Asians, it's, it's much, much higher, while in the other groups, it's really low. So, a slightly different uh, way of like depicting this. So we aggregated across phenotype categories earlier, but like how about we, if we see the actual incremental R square values for each phenotypes overlaying the incremental R square for European ancestry individuals in the x-axis and non-European ancestry individuals in the y-axis. So if you see perfect overlap in the incremental R square, you see the four, like most of the phenotypes would have uh, lied around like the 45 degree line. But clearly you can see for African versus European ancestry individuals in the first panel, the slope is, is about 23.23, which is clearly shows you the deviation from the 45 degree line, much lower. Uh, so the line that you see surrounding the uh, phenotypes are the uh, best fit linear line. And when you see the uh, European versus East Asian, you see slight improvement in terms of the deviation from the 45 degree line, but clearly you see uh, a, a, a clear deviation. But you can actually appreciate like where each phenotypes lie in terms of the prediction power. And for South Asian versus European ancestry, you see that getting closer to the 45 degree line uh, with the slope of 0.6.
So next steps uh, will be selecting quasi-causal SNPs uh, to identify uh, uh, top heat SNPs and we'll be estimating the uh, ancestry specific heritability, compute the loss of accuracy. Uh, and in terms of uh, the PGIs will be uh, using a within family GWAS weights because that would give us uh, approximately uh, direct estimates of the PGIs, direct genetic effects of the PGIs. And this would reduce potential co founding due to residual population stratification, assortative mating, and gene by environment interaction effect. And this would give us more accurate loss of accuracy estimates. So, with this, I'll wind up my presentation. I'll be happy to take questions later on. Thanks so much. Hi everyone, my name is Brooke Sasha. I'm a graduate student in clinical psychology here at UW-Madison. And, oh, perfect, that has pulled up, great. Uh, and my project uh, that I will be sharing with you today is titled Examining a Mechanism of Polygenic Scores on Developmental Trajectories of Externalizing Behaviors. So externalizing behaviors are negative behaviors that are at odds with or directed toward the environment. And they usually have negative impacts to oneself and their family, as well as society. And externalizing behaviors are also heritable, and about 56 to 89 percent of the variance can be attributed to genetic differences between people. And this is quite a large range, and that's for a couple of reasons. And the first is that heritability estimates differ based on developmental period. So, for example, the heritability of externalizing changes from childhood to adolescence to adulthood. And more severe or persistent externalizing behaviors also have higher heritability estimates than less severe or less severe externalizing behaviors. And lastly, while genes and environment are both risk factors for the development of externalizing, there is a lot less work looking at how they um, how specific mechanisms can lead to the development of externalizing if we hope to implement successful psychosocial interventions. So there's a couple of challenges that have made studying externalizing really hard. And the first is that most studies lack a developmental perspective. So they're studying, studying externalizing at one specific period in time, whether that be childhood, adolescence, et cetera. And the second is that dimensions are more representative than categories of psychopathology. And this is the case both clinically and etiologically. And third, very few studies that leverage current genetic approaches utilize mechanisms in this work. So questions about mechanisms in genetics are really important because interventions aren't likely to target the genes themselves in these complex outcomes, but rather the environment. So there's three objectives that this project had, and the first is to characterize developmental trajectories of externalizing over time. The second is to apply a well-powered polygenic score to test associations by trajectory. And the third is to examine a mechanism for this process via parenting behaviors. So the first objective is characterizing developmental trajectories, and this is over approximately a 30-year period. And Externalizing behaviors were broadly defined based on this framework. So this is the hierarchical taxonomy of psychopathology or high top framework. And high top organizes psychopathology in a hierarchical way with each level becoming increasingly specific. So up here at the top, you see externalizing and it is very broad and then very specific signs and symptoms come together at the bottom and are clustered based on how similar they are to one another and often they co-occur. So this reflects the natural organization of psychopathology and allows for comorbidity to exist within individuals in a predictable way. So there are two main sub-dimensions of externalizing, and those are disinhibition and antagonism. And disinhibition is related to impulsivity, disorganization, and substance use or problems. Whereas antagonism has to do with physical or relational aggression, theft, destruction of property, etc. So this project will utilize these two broad dimensions to study externalizing because there is research to suggest that they have different developmental pathways as well as unique genetic underpinnings, even though they're also highly related. 
So objective one targets these two limitations of externalizing behaviors being really different over the course of development and a categorical focus on psychopathology. So to do this, or to target these limitations, characterizing trajectories, and utilizing this high top framework to study externalizing. So the second objective is applying a well-powered polygenic score for externalizing. And this will be coming from the most recent GWAS for externalizing behaviors. And it had a sample size of around 1.5 million people. And we'll be using this GWAS to create polygenic scores for participants in ad health. And a little bit more about the externalizing GWAS that I wanted to mention. So conducted primarily uh, people of U European ancestry, and they identified 579 unique SNPs. So demonstrating that externalizing is a really polygenic, excuse me, a really um, your polygenic phenotype. And Lastly, the externalizing PGS explained a really large amount of variance in an externalizing factor, and this is akin to the educational attainment GWAS, and also a lot of the really common variables that are used in social science research, like parental socioeconomic status, but it's really important to test whether this would change when we account for development. So, and as many of you know, it's really common in studies to only use participants of European ancestry, given that GWAS are very heavily skewed towards its groups. And we wanted to also include other ancestry groups in this study. So to do this, we conducted preliminary multinomial logistic regression models, looking at the interaction between the externalizing PGS and self-reported race in ad health. And from these analyses, we did not find uh, consistent signals in those models. So we proceeded with running the full MLR models with all of the self-reported race groups in ad health and used self-reported race as a covariate. So we characterize externalizing in ad health using data from waves one through five when participants were aged 13 to 41. And antagonism was measured using five different items that were measured across all five waves. And similarly, disinhibition used three items that were also measured at all five waves and measured the frequency of use for those three substances. So the third objective is to examine a mechanism for these polygenic scores, and that is the, that mechanism is supportive parenting. So supportive parenting involves closeness, warmth, and involvement between parent and their children. And its association with externalizing behaviors is very well established in the literature, such that higher levels of supportive parenting is associated with lower levels of externalizing behaviors. And at health, this was measured in wave one in the in-home interviews, and they assessed these different categories there's a couple of sample items and we created a sum score with these items for, from the adolescent's perspective of their parents' behavior. This is the hypothesized mediation model. So this shows that the direction of each of the uh, pathways that we think we'll have, and we hypothesize that the PGS for externalizing will predict the most persistent or chronic pathways of externalizing behaviors, given that the heritability is higher in those pathways. And this effect will partially operate through supportive parenting as a mechanism. So finally, last limitation is that there's little focus on mechanisms in genetics. So we'll use this really well-powered PGS to study supportive parenting as a mechanism. So getting into my results, here is the latent developmental trajectories of antagonism. So on the x-axis, you have age from 13 to 41, and on the y-axis is the antagonism sum score. So we found four distinct trajectories of antagonism. Those were high decline, so very high levels of antisocial or antagonistic behaviors in adolescents that declined steadily across time and were very close to zero by age 41. Adolescents peaked, so this group had very high levels of antagonism in adolescents that sharply declined entering into early adulthood. And the moderate group had low to mid levels, but at a much uh, steadier range over time. And lastly, the low group. So 
Following that, we conducted multinomial logistic regression and using the low class as the reference class, we found that only the, the high decline trajectory was most associated with the externalizing PGS relative to the low trajectory. And the adolescence peaked and moderate compared to the low trajectory were not associated with the externalizing PGS. And this could be because as hypothesized from the literature, genes are more likely to be involved in trajectories that are more chronic or persist over time. And this is also over and effect the above over, excuse me, over and above the effect of disinhibition as we controlled for that in our models. And regarding disinhibition, a three-class model emerged as the best fit, and that had three classes. So again, on the x-axis, you have age, y-axis, you have disinhibition sum score, and those three classes were high use, typical use, and low use. And unlike antagonism, the low class here did not serve as the reference trajectory, and this was for two primary reasons. And the first was that the typical use class had the greatest proportion of participants in this trajectory compared to the others. And two, there's a lot of data to suggest that it's really typical that adolescents will engage or try substances prior to the age of 21. And interestingly, a really similar pattern emerged here such that the externalizing PGS was most associated with the high use class relative to the typical use class. And this was not the case for the low class. So moving on to the mediation results, we tested the relationship between the externalizing PGS and antagonism such that it was informed by the multinomial logistic regression. So the outcome was dichotomous with only the high decline class and the low class. And the covariates were the same as the multinomial logistic regression models. And we found partial mediation such that supportive parenting partially mediated the high decline trajectory, which was in support of our hypothesis. In terms of disinhibition, a similar outcome in that there was a dichotomous outcome between the high use class and the typical use class. And there, same covariates, and again, supportive parenting was a significant partial mediator for and acting as a mechanism for the relationship between the externalizing PGS and the trajectories of disinhibition. So to conclude, there are clearly established trajectories of externalizing behaviors and individual differences in the way that they develop over time. There's a lot of heterogeneity in uh, the way that they look and the way that groups fall into the different trajectories and genetic effects may actually be differentiable for those. For example, PGS are more predictive of certain trajectories over others. And a really logical next future step would be to look at how different risk and protective factors may differ for those different developmental trajectories over time. And I think another main takeaway here is that not only is the externalizing superspectrum phenotypically distinct, but at the developmental level, the externalizing polygenic score seems to only be having a signal for the most chronic and persistent trajectories. So it's just those that the rarest group that falls into those pathways. And this project provides, I think, a lot of context around the percent variance explained in the from the externalizing polygenic score. And it might not be as straightforward of an association as we think. So this is kind of addressing one of those key limitations about the focusing on a certain point in time and externalizing, not just adulthood or childhood, but really focusing on a substantial piece of the lifespan. So with that, a couple of acknowledgments to my advisor, Dr. James Lee, the other grad students in our lab, uh, the undergrads, and the social genomics group as well for providing feedback on early versions of this project. So thank you all so much for your attention. So thanks everybody. Uh, so we're moving on to session two. You know, there's a lot of overlap in all of our sessions, but this one we've loosely uh, gathered under using genetics to answer social science questions. So um, I'll have each of the speakers do whatever kind of introduction they want, and they'll each have 15 minutes as before, and then we'll collect Q&A at the very end after we hear from all three. So Marta, you're up first.
Hi everyone, I am Marta Bilgeze, a um, research assistant at the University of Southern California and with uh, Patrick Turley, I've been working for the past few years on a project to develop a general approach to adjusting genetic studies for assortative mating. So what do we care about assortative mating? Assortative mating can affect the genome and therefore the interpretation of genetic studies. So it would be great to learn what these studies would say under random mating. And there is a large body of theory on the influence of assortative mating on the genome. So technically, we can use this large body of theory to build adjustments for assortative mating. However, adjustments based on this theory would need to rely on strong assumptions about the sorting mechanism, the equilibrium state, and other relevant sorting parameters. Instead, we propose a general approach that can estimate what the genetic correlation would be in a randomly mating population, and correct Mendelian randomization estimates for between chromosome correlations due to assortative mating. So our work also has an empirical leg, which focuses on studies between education and health. And the two results are first, that assortative mating influences studies of genetic correlation between education and health traits by about 14% on average. Uh, I will not discuss our genetic correlation results in this presentation. What I will instead focus on is point two. Uh, Mendelian randomization studies involving education should be viewed skeptically, as the inflation in the Mendelian randomization estimates due to assortative mating uh, driven between chromosome correlation is about 30% on average. And on top of this, we also identified a novel assortative mating driven bias that is not controlled for. And potentially there are many other problems with Mendelian randomization. Briefly on what is assortative mating. Uh, assortative mating is whenever mates have correlated phenotypes and genotypes. Uh, examples of sorting include a single trait assortative mating, where both mates are highly educated, for example, cross trait assortative mating, uh, for example, a healthy person mates with a highly educated person, uh, and multi trait assortative mating, which is probably the most realistic one where people face trade offs. Uh, where I'm willing to trade some um, health for a higher education. Uh, assortative mating in terms of consequences on the genome induces between chromosome correlations. And the, the idea of, of our method is be, be able to adjust uh, Mendelian randomization estimates and genetic correlation estimates for these between chromosome correlations. Let me now discuss um, two issues in Mendelian randomization um, related to assortative mating. So first, the first problem is that assortative mating introduces a stricter um, exclusion condition. So uh, for exclusion, I mean that the, we mean that the effect of any instrument or any one of our SNPs on the outcome must be mediated uh, by its effect on the treatment. Uh, exclusion is probably not satisfied from, from the outset and literature has developed methods that, are con that produce consistent estimates, even if not all the instruments are valid. For example, MR median, which requires that at least half your instruments are um, valid ones. Uh, even if one is very optimistic about the validity of the instruments, assertative mating worsens things because it induces between chromosome correlations. So uh, the thing is that assertative mating induces correlation between all trait associated SNPs. And the consequence of this is that either all SNPs associated with the treatment are valid instruments or none of them is. So it doesn't matter if you're using MR median, MR agar, MR mode, because all of these methods ultimately are going to be equivalently problematic in this, in this sense. Then the second problem is a novelty introduced by our paper, which we call SNP selection bias. We've seen that assertative mating influences the selection of SNPs that are to be included in our MR analysis. To avoid weak instrument bias, we only want to include in MR studies SNPs that meet a significance criterion. Let me give you an example of how this works. So for example, say that there is sorting on the outcome and say that outcome and the treatment have a positive genetic correlation. So for any one of our instruments, for any one of our SNP J, um, the bias, of the GWAS association of SNPJ with the treatment is going to be proportional to the size of the J's GWAS association with the outcome. 
So this means that ultimately we're going to have greater power to include SNPs that have a large GWAS association with the outcome, which is going to lead to larger MR ratios. So when I, whenever I say MR ratio, I mean just the, the ratio of the um, GWAS association for the outcome over the GWAS association for the treatment for, for any one of, of our SNPs, which leads to further upward bias to our MR estimates because, of course, beta GWAS is at the, the numerator of our MR ratio. So ultimately, we're going to end up with a further upward bias to our, to our Mendelian randomization estimates. Um, so one question then is, when do we need to worry about SNP selection bias? So we build a very general sorting model that extends existing theory, and we derive two conditions under which we expect to see SNP selection bias. So first, if there is cross-trait assortative mating and your treatment is heritable, and the second condition is if you have sorting on the outcome and you have a non-zero genetic correlation between treatment and outcome. Note that this bias persists. Even if you adjust your GWAS associations, treatment and outcome GWAS associations, for the between chromosome correlations. So let me now introduce the adjustment that we propose uh, for long range LD in Mendelian randomization. First, I'll give a high level introduction that I'll, I'll get into specifics. So our adjustment approximates how much of the Mendelian randomization estimate is due to a sortative mating driven long range LD. So the idea is to remove the component of the GWAS associations that is due to the between chromosome correlations. Note that our adjustment um, ignores the assortative mating induced within chromosome correlations. Uh, however, there are a few within SNPs chromosome pairs, so ultimately the within chromosome assortative mating is likely going to be small. And then we use PGIs uh, to estimate how much um, variation is due to the between chromosome long range, um, well, LD. So now the specifics. This is our adjustment for long range um, LD. Um, so for any SNP, they say ZJ, any SNP associated with uh, the treatment, we adjust the treatment GWAS betas with K, J, T for treatment, which is a ratio of two things. So let me start at the denominator here. Uh, the denominator is the sum of the covariance between SNP J and chrom the single chromosome specific, all the single chromosome specific PGI. So the covariance between SNP J and the PGI built on chromosome one, then the covariance of SNP J and the PGI built on chromosome two, and you sum them up. So, and at the numerator, we have the covariance between SNP J and the chromosome specific PGI built on the chromosome on which SNP J is on. So this ratio should be one when you have random mating because under random mating, one SNP is not going to be correlated with other SNPs and other chromosomes. But when you have assortative mating, that's not necessarily the case. So when you have assortative mating, this ratio is not necessarily one. Note that we are um, de facto ignoring the error in the PGIs because here we use the PGIs, um, sorry, here we're using the PGIs, but we should be using the additive genetic factor. We're just proxying it with the PGIs. But we think that the error will partially cancel out since it's present at both the numerator and at the denominator. And uh, we've ran simulations which suggest that this concern should be small. So then the adjusted GWAS beta is going to be the unadjusted GWAS beta on the right hand side here, uh, multiplied by its by the K. And we do this for every SNP in our in our MR analysis for the adjust for the treatment and for the outcome. Uh, note that once again, this adjustment only accounts for between chromosome correlation and not for SNP selection bias and other potential biases. So let me now show you the results. Um, so our, our empirical results on the on the y-axis we have the MR estimate. What we're trying to estimate is the effect of education on health, uh, and these are the health traits that we that we use. Uh, so CPD here is cigarettes per day. Um, DEP is depression. DPW is drinks per week, and self self health is self rated health. Um, 
by looking at the lighter, uh, lighter bar here, we see that um, education seems to have um, seems to have a positive impact on on health across um, all the health variables that we consider. Uh, but once we look at the the darker bar, which is our AM adjusted median, the picture is is more nuanced. And uh, on average, we see about a thirty percent inflation to our Mendelian randomization estimates from um, AM-driven, assortative mating-driven, long-range LD. Uh, let me talk about SNP selection bias for one second to understand how severe that may be when it's present. And let's look at um, height. So we've added a, a height as a, as a negative control, as a, as a placebo, because we're using the, um, uh, the UKB, which is based in, in, in the UK. So it's a developed country, and we would have expected the effect of education on height uh, to, be, um, to be zero. And once we correct for long-range LD, we're able to shrink um, the initial a, um, MR estimate by quite a bit. But there's still a long way um, to zero. It's, it's not near, near zero here. Um, so we think that when SNP selection bias is present, so we think that this is due to SNP selection bias, should be due to SNP selection bias. So when it's present, it looks like it's at least as large as the long range LD problem. Uh, introduced by assortative mating. And we've ran simulations that seem to confirm this. Um, so in conclusion, we've seen that Mendelian randomization exacerbates the bias due to between chromosome correlation, and it induces SNP selection bias. And we've seen two conditions under which we expect to see SNP selection bias in Mendelian randomization. Um, our adjustment accounts for between chromosome correlation but not for the SNP selection bias. Uh, Mendelian randomization studies involving education should be viewed skeptically, or in general, um, any trait for which we expect to be strong sorting, as SNP selection bias and other potential biases are still there. Uh, and our simulations have shown that single trait assortative mating, well, We've, we've seen, I haven't, haven't shown you the simulations, uh, that even single trait assortative mating can bias Mendelian randomization, which is contrary to a previous study, Hartwig et al., um, 2018. Uh, but they adopt a narrower simulation strategy and they conclude that single trait assortative mating is not really problematic for Mendelian randomization. In terms of genetic correlation, which is the bit that I haven't shown in this presentation, uh, we've seen through simulations that our adjustment can fully, almost fully correct for assortative mating bias in genetic correlation, and that assortative mating has a moderate effect on the genetic correlation between education and health, uh, which is contrary to a larger number that a previous study, Border et al. 2022, found theoretically possible. Um, finally, thank you to um, our collaborators. Dan Benjamin, Paul, Michael, Miles, and John for helping out a lot with the code, and Patrick Turley, who's the brain behind this project. Um, thank you so much. How do I do anything? Okay, let's do Okay. Good. Okay. Okay. Oops. 
Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Jonathan Beauchamp from George Mason University, and I'm delighted to be here at this great conference today. I'll be talking about adverse selection in insurance markets due to genetic prediction. And this is joint work with Eduardo Esvedo and Richard Carlson Minner. So, as some of you may have heard, the predictive power of genetic data has been rising rapidly, including for common diseases and health conditions. And now, many resources now provide PGI based disease risk prediction, uh, 23andMe, Prometheus, Genomics PLC, and various genetic risk calculators out there where you input your genetic data that you can download from 23andMe or elsewhere, and it predicts your risk for various disease. In our future health, which is like the big sister or the small sister, depending on how you see it, to the UKB, is providing PGI-informed feedback to participants. And we heard this morning from Dorothy that also all of us does something similar, providing prediction uh, based on PGI to participants. Also, clinical trials are now underway to integrate PGIs in routine screening procedures uh, that are used by doctors. Um, and genotyping costs, in fact, are no more than blood, basic blood panel and cholesterol tests. So it's really hard to envisage a, a future where PGI are not used like, in a widespread way for pretty much everyone to predict their diseases and that this information is in people's hands. So at least it's a very likely future. And in fact, last week's New York Times had an article, um, well, in last week, entitled to prevent earth attacks, doctors try a new genetic test. Oh, the test polygenic score that predicts cardiovascular disease or heart attack. And they say polygenic risk scores could help patients, including younger ones, understand whether they really need early treatment for heart disease. And that's indeed a very plausible application. Another plausible application will be that this can help participants decide whether to buy more or less health insurance, which is what we'll focus on now. Um, so in most markets, genetic discrimination is illegal. What that means, in particular in our case, um, is that for health insurers, it's typically illegal for them to use genetic data to screen consumers, where yes, they can use all type of other th things like blood lipids, uh, family history, and so on uh, to screen consumers, but they're not allowed to use genetic data. Uh, okay, I can keep talking. Uh, I'll, I'll keep talking for now. So basically, the um, so it's illegal for insurers to use this, but on the other hand, it's the consumers have this information in their hands, or rather will have it more and more as we predict. Uh, and on that basis, they're allowed to use that information to, um, to select uh, whether to buy more insurance or less insurance. And so this could spell, based on basic common sense and economic theory, uh, this could spell trouble for some markets for health insurance due to what economists call adverse selection. And so adverse selection, I have a slide on this now, but um, we'll, uh, it's the next slide, if we can go to the next slide. Am I, okay, whoops, okay. Okay, this seems to be working now. Okay, adverse selection refers to um, when buyers and sellers have different information. Market participant with key information may participate selectively in the market at the expense of other parties. So it's a very well-known phenomenon in economics that's been very well studied. Uh, but to highlight this for non-economists, so consider a potential insurance consumer who knows they are genetically predisposed to develop certain disease, such as Alzheimer's. Well, they may decide rationally to buy more insurance to protect themselves against Alzheimer's in old age. And if the insurers are not allowed to use that information to charge more for such a consumer, uh, well, then this, such a market could uh, unravel. Okay, a market for such insurance products against Alzheimer's. Uh, for instance, the high-risk consumer on the basis of their genetic information may, 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 may buy more insurance, and the cost of insuring such high-risk consumers is, of course, higher in expected value, uh, which to, leads insurers to increase the, the price for, for all the consumers. And as such, the lower-risk consumers will buy less insurance because they have to pay higher price now. And then this further increases the average price for consumers because you have a higher risk pool of consumers and so on and so forth. And then this way you can have the market unraveling until the point where only the highest risk consumer is the one for whom it makes sense to buy insurance. Okay. So our contribution in this paper is to study this, but more specifically, we develop an econometric model to estimate disease risk based on current and future PGIs, controlling for relevant observables. Then we apply that model to estimate the current and future projected distribution of disease risk for a suite of diseases UK, using UKB data. And for this, we coded a rich set of covariates typically observed by insurers for each disease. So we can compare really the information that's contained in the PGI versus what's already observed by insurers. 
And then finally, we use economic theory to assess the implication for the market for critical illness insurance, which I'll describe a bit later what this is exactly. We use Nathaniel Hendren's competitive insurance market model. Oops. Um, a note on economic theory, without going into detail, there's been substantial progress in economic theory in the last two decades in modeling insurance markets. An influential model is the one by Nathaniel Hendren that quantifies the extent of asymmetric information and helps identify when markets may break down. So asymmetric information is when the consumer has more information than the insurer, or vice versa. But in our case, it's when the consumer has more, or not necessarily has more, but is allowed to use more. In this case, it's the insurer is not allowed to use all the information. Even if the insurer had the genetic information, they wouldn't be allowed to use it. Okay. Um, so one key metric in that market is the implicit tax, also known as the pooled price ratio. So this is defined as follows. So for a consumer with disease risk R, it captures the extra amount they'd have to pay if charged the actuarially fair price for the market segment comprising all consumers with risk larger than R versus if they were charged their actually fair price. Um, so to make this a bit more concrete, suppose I know on basis on my, my, my information, my covariates and project score, that my risk of developing Alzheimer's is 5% in my life. Well, then my implicit tax is the ratio of basically what uh, I'd have to pay if the insurer charge a created market segment that's all consumers with risk at least 5% and more. So, and they charge the actually fair price for this versus my actually fair price. So the former actual fair price is higher because the whole segment of risk higher than 5% is higher on average than my risk. So basically it's just, it's how much extra I have to pay to be in that market segment. Okay. And this can be computed from the risk distribution for any insurance price buckets. Insurers like to bucket their market, as I'll discuss later. So basically this can be uh, computed from this. Theoretically, a high implicit tax may cause insurance markets to break down. And empirically, Hendren looks at many markets in car insurance, auto insurance, uh, fire insurance, all health insurance, all type of things. And he finds that implicit taxes that were between 7 and 35% typically was associated with markets that were functioning. Uh, but when it's above that, above 40%, the market typically had unraveled. Okay? And we're thinking about the implicit tax for the consumer at the 80th percentile. That's what he was looking at. Okay. Uh, wait a minute. Okay. So we develop an econometric model to, to, uh, to first estimate the risk of the disease. So we first estimate the risk of developing a disease based on covariates in the PGI, based on the current PGI, that's pretty easy. And then on future PGI, that's a little more implicated uh, involved. So for this, it's a, without going into details here, and in the interest of time, we have a profit model where the disease marker is equal to one, if the liability L, script L is greater than zero and it's equal to zero otherwise. And the liability is, depends on the future polygenic score, G star, plus the covariates W, and a normal error term U. And so we need to specify the conditional distribution of G star, the future polygenic score, store, score conditional covariates. And we also observe the actual polygenic score G hat, which is simply the future polygenic score plus error, which is error due to sampling variation in the GWAS. And from this, the key assumption here is we have to assume what's the future polygenic score's predictive power, R squared of the future PGI. So if we assume, based on an um, educated guess, we, we assume a certain predictive power of future PGIs. From this, we can plug this in the model and, and calculate the future disease risk or the future distribution of disease risk. I'm glancing over deta details here, but that's the general idea. The model is similar in spirit to the model in Becker et al. Um, which is the paper for the polygenic uh, score repository, uh, but the mechanics are quite different in the details because we model here binary traits. Okay, now let me talk about the market for critical illness insurance, which is what we'll model. Uh, critical illness insurance provides insurance buyers with one lump sum payment if and when they contract a covered long-term critical illness. These are illness such as Alzheimer's, car uh, heart attack, breast cancer, etc. Uh, I'll go more over example disease. This market is very well developed in some countries, particularly some European countries and some Asian countries. It's not very well developed in the US for some reasons. Um, and we simulate this market for critical illness insurance using UKB data. We do not actually observe actual insurance data. We observe a suite of typically covered illnesses, the rich set of covariates that are typically used by insurers, and the current day PGIs. And then on that basis, we simulate the distribution of risk and draw implication. So we do this for eight diseases uh, that are typically covered by critical illness insurance products. 
These are Alzheimer's, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, coronary artery disease, depression, prostate cancer, schizophrenia, and type 2 diabetes. And here in the last two columns, we report the twin irritability and the SNP irritability of the trait. We use these to project the future predictive power of polygenic scores. So we will do two scenarios. One scenario where the future predictive power of polygenic score is equal to the SNP irritability of the trait, and one where it's equal to the twin irritability. Now, of course, we don't expect polygenic score to actually explain as much as twin irritability because there will always be wear variants and so on. So we see this as a lower bound, uh, as an upper bound. And the SNP irritability, we see a bit as a lower bound as the future expected predictive power of polygenic score, simply because this is only based on SNP right now and future polygenic score integrates sequencing data and so on. Anyways, we can debate about what's the reasonable number, but I think we provide this as a guide. Basically, you can, you can make it. Okay, for the rest of the presentation, I'll go over a number of graphs that we produce and draw the implications, focusing on one disease, which is prostate cancer here. But we do this for all eight diseases that we cover. So here's basically an histogram of the distribution of risk of developing prostate cancer by age 65. So on the x-axis, you have the risk, and on the y-axis, you have the frequency of observations of individuals uh, for each risk level. And we see the mean risk is around 0 0.5, 0 0.05 here. And in blue, we have the what's called the standard risk class, and in red, we have the high risk class. This is to uh, mimic insurer behavior. Insurers typically bucket their market segments, their, their consumers, based on their risk levels. The standard risk class is everyone with a risk level between 0 0.75 to 1.25 times the average risk. And the high risk class in red is every consumer's with risk level based on the covariates that are observables, that's between 1.75 and 2.25, uh, the average risk. And we will focus on the standard risk class here, but we can do this also with the high risk class or any risk class you want. Uh, but just for this presentation, I'll focus on the standard risk class. But before that, here's a graph showing um, uh, the implicit tax as a function of risk. So basically on the x-axis here, you have the percentile of one's risk. So basically, I don't have a point here, but this dotted line, vertical line to the right is basically 80th percentile of risk. Someone whose risk is actually 6.8%, as you can see on the bottom axis. Um, and the y-axis here is the implicit tax for such a consumer. So we can see here, if the insurer was doing no bucketing at all of consumer and was just taking all the consumers on basis of their caveats and charging the same price for everyone, the implicit tax for consumer at the 80th percentile of risk would be about 28%, which is in the healthy theory, there would be no unraveling in this insurance market. When insurers actually do price discriminate, they, um, they bucket consumers. And then if we focus only on the standard risk class, the insurers reduce the implicit tax to 6.8% by bucketing consumers within the standard risk class, you still have selection because people within the standard risk class still have different level of risks. Um, but now this is only with observable covariates that both the consumer and the insurer observe. Things such as BMI, PSA screening, which is important for breast cancer, um, family history, um, your neighborhood, socioeconomic status, and things like that. Basically, insurers do observe and do use to model things. And they have, here you don't have any asymmetric information. Now let's look what happens if we introduce polygenic scores. So here are four histograms. The first one in the top left is the one we already saw, where we see the histogram of risk with covariates only. Then on the top right, we add, we add uh, the histogram of risk based on current covariates plus the PGI. Okay, so this is the risk, the the, the predicted risk based on covariates and PGI. And then the bottom left, we add uh, the future day PGI based on assuming the future PGI as explains as much as SNP irritability. And then finally, the last in the bottom right is the histogram of risk based on future PGI, assuming that that PGI is, is, uh, predicts as much as the twin irritability of the trait, which might be an overestimate. We see this as an upper bound. As you can see, as you go from top left to right to bottom left to bottom right, um, what's happening with the distribution is it's going toward a spike at zero. And if we had a perfect predictor, you'd also have a spike at once. Basically, if you had a predictor that's perfect of your risk of disease, you add everyone has zero risk of the disease, who's going to not have the disease, and everyone's going to have it, the disease, basically. So if you get better and better at predictor, you'll get like the, the middle of the distribution flattening out and peaks at one and zero. Okay. Okay. Now look at the, let's look at the implicit tax once we have only the covariates plus the current PGI. So this is the same graph as we added before for the implicit tax implicit tax, except that now for the standard risk class again, except that now we have asymmetric information. We have the covariates that the observer, the insurer observes, and we have the current PGI that only the consumer observes. 
So you see for prostate cancer, the suggest there should always already be with current APGI problem in this insurance market. Now you may wonder why isn't this market unraveled? Well, we'd we'll say that basically this is still not widespread tool. People don't really use their, their, their PGI to, uh, to predict their risk of prostate cancer yet. I believe that within one or two decades, this will not be the case anymore, and people will use this information. It will be provided to them as routine medical procedure. Okay? Um, but here, basically, this suggests that even with current PGI, there's a risk for the market to unravel if people were to use that information. Now, assuming the PGI explains as much as the SNP irritability of the trait, at the 80th percentile, we get an implicit tax of 84%, which is pretty much the highest that Hendren observed empirically across all type of insurance markets he observed, he, he studied. And then if we assume that the Poisonous score explains as much as the twin irritability, then the implicit tax will explain as much as four, more than 400, it will be more than 400%, which is through the roof, and there's no market that can survive this if the, the consumer is in the least rational. So what's the conclusion from this? It says that if there's no bundling, and there is bundling, so we have to, to do more in this project, but if there were no bundling and the insurers were selling these products for disease by disease, um, well, this would not be a viable market anymore uh, if genetic discrimination is illegal. So the solution to this, I don't have a conclusion slide because in the interest of time, I cut it, but I'll just say our conclusion for this is not so much that we should allow this genetic discrimination. I mean, maybe, maybe not. It doesn't sound nice, but to economists, that's kind of a normal thing. But the conclusion is we should study this. Uh, I mean, we, we have different preferences, but for policy, just going as we go, where we allow consumers to use their information, but not insurers, is not a good idea, at least in the simplified environment we modeled here. More research is needed. So the main point of this is just to show, look, this is something we have to think about uh, and do proper policy. Okay? Thank you. Uh, hi all, I'm David Hugh Jones. Um, I'm from the UK, currently not at any university. Um, if you've seen this paper last year at BGA, um, we've got some new stuff. We got um, a couple of new co-authors and some new data from Norway. Um, can we go backwards? Can I go backwards? I can, fine. Um, so, so, yeah, there's, there's some, some new stuff to tell you about. So the, the, the broadest background for this paper is that if you think of the first law of behavioral genetics, um, genetics explains about half of variation in a lot of human characteristics. And that raises a question for a social scientist like me, which is, well, what, what do I do now? Um, one possible answer would be that um, half of all the staff in any social science department ought to be geneticists. I endorse this approach. Um, but I, I also want to do, you know, not really being a proper geneticist myself, I, I want to have some, some role left. Um, so one thing that you can think about is, well, where do these genes come from? So you can think about making people's genetics the dependent variable. And of course, there are lots of social processes that influence the distribution of genetic variants in society. There's assortative mating, which we've already heard about. Um, and we're going to talk about more in this paper. There's migration between different regions, because when people go to different places, they bring their genes with them. And there's even natural selection. So me and Abdel Abdullahi have a sort of uh, agenda of looking at the uh, putting genetics on the left hand side of the estimation equation. OK, about this paper specifically, some sort of broad goals, getting in increasing order of ambition and decreasing order of um, specificity. Um, to explain a puzzle about the persistence of inequality across generations. To look at what we call the genes SES gradient. So if you look between rich and poor, high and low income people, they differ on their polygenic scores for a bunch of different things. And trying to understand why that is, is important. Um, to rethink the nature of inequality in historical human societies and to change how we think about genetic variation to core. Um, so, as I said, many genetic measures, including polygenic scores for education and for health outcomes, they differ between people of low and high socioeconomic status. The leading explanation for this is something like meritocracy. Suppose you have genetic variants that cause you um, to be successful in labor markets, like maybe they make you very smart. So now you're successful, you're high income, you pass those genetics onto your children, and you also pass SES onto your children by things like inherited wealth. 
or by you know they're them getting better educated because of your socioeconomic position. And as a result, you get a correlation between SES and genetics. That's the sort of standard explanation. It applies well to modern meritocracies, and it probably applies well to something like educational attainment, where you can see there's a very obvious link with success in labor markets. Here's another explanation. Um, think about marriage markets. High SES is often considered desirable. It's nice to, to, to marry someone who's, who's wealthy or rich or powerful or high status. And there are also other things that are considered desirable, like being smart or being good looking, that are partly under genetic control. So if you have high status, you might marry someone who is smart, good looking, whatever. Um, and then again, both SES and genetics are inherited by the next generation. Let's call this social genetic assortative mating. And what that means in particular is that shocks to your social status, including environmental shocks to your social status, will be reflected in the DNA of your children via the mechanism of who you marry. The second implication is that the, the, the size of the genes and SES gradient is going to depend on social structure and even on policy variables. So for example, think about the level of persistence of inherited wealth. That's going to affect not just inequality, but also the correlation between genetics and inherited wealth via marriage markets. Um, and in fact, the, the, the last implication is that um, the genes SES gradient is likely historically widespread because while meritocracy is really mostly observed in modern societies, assortative mating is probably a historical universal throughout all societies. Okay, I'm going to skip the literature just in the interest of time. Uh, there are some people who've thought about this before. Both economists and geneticists have thought about assortative mating, um, but we think that bringing this stuff together is in, in a way quite new. So we, we got a simple model. People have two traits. They got a genetic trait, and they got an SES trait, which could be income or wealth. Um, and they, th those two things together make you more or less attractive in a marriage market. And like many standard economic models of marriage markets, people marry others who are at the same percentile of attractiveness. So, you know, the most attractive pair couple off and then everyone else couples off. So sort of simple, but not captures something maybe. Um, so people mate assortatively. Children inherit their parents' genes by the standard biological mechanism, and they also inherit SES. And how much of the SES they inherit is, uh, that depends on social structure. So we've got this parameter theta that reflects the persistence of SES across generations. And that can vary in different societies. Let's say, you know, you change inheritance tax, that's going to change that persistence of SES. And the intuition here on the screen is that if you take those dots there, that's a couple of parents, one with a high SES, one with quote unquote good genes. Um, they pair off, they have children, and their children are in between them on both of those traits. As a result, the distribution of those traits, which starts off independent in the first generation, it gets squeezed down those iso-attractiveness lines. And so you end up with those two things being correlated. So there's a, a, a picture of the long run correlation. And you can see that it uh, increases with the level of um, theta, which is the, the, the measure of the inheritance of SES. Um, and it also varies with the level of what, what, counts, what makes up your attractiveness in a marriage market. If both SES and genes contribute to your, your overall attractiveness, then that increases the ultimate correlation between socioeconomic status and genetics. And that, you know, the correlations can, there, can vary from essentially zero up to kind of pretty high, like 0 0.6. Okay. Um, we got data from the UK and from Norway. I'll talk about it briefly, but I'll skip that for the moment. Um, you guys all don't know what polygenic score for educational attainment is. Um, this is just me for, for any social scientist telling them no polygenic scores really do uh, predict whether you go to university or not. Um, I've been told that you shouldn't really draw these sort of pictures with the um, means of particular bins because they don't capture variation within, um, you know, within you, what you should draw is a scatter plot of individual outcomes. So I did that, but it didn't work too well. <laughs> so um, here's the picture of our, our, our main mechanism in, in one graph, right? On the, this is the UK data from UK Biobank. On the x-axis, we've got whether you went to university or not. 
or your income decile in your first job. That's kind of guesstimated. And on the y-axis, we've got your spouse's polygenic score for educational attainment. And what you can see is essentially there's a big association between the two. So that's the core of our empirical mechanism. That's not quite enough to prove it because, of course, my genetics also affect whether I go to university. So maybe this picture could just be gene-gene assortative mating. And I promised you that an environmental shock to your SES would change your partner's polygenic score and therefore your children's polygenic scores. So I'm going to look for an environmental shock. Um, and we need a, a shock that's uh, independent of genetics, affects your socioeconomic status, and it's got to it's got to like work for a really big N because these are quite noisy mechanisms we're we're picking out. Polygenic scores are noisy, variation in SES is noisy, and the spouse matching process is unpredictable, as I think Shakespeare once said. Um, so we use birth order. Early born siblings are well known to they they get more attention from their parents. And as a result, they, they do better on a wide range of life, life outcomes. And at the same time, siblings have the same expected polygenic score by the lottery of meiosis. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to run a kind of mediation analysis where we look at birth order. We see if it affects your spouse PSEA. And when the, then we see how much of that birth order effect is mediated by SES mediators, including whether you went to university and your income. Um, there's the sort of way where we're throwing in some other non-SES style mediators. We've got some controls, like obviously we need to have a bunch of family sized dummies. So we'll always be looking within the, the same size of sibling group. And we've also got parents age at birth. Um, here's the first stage. What you can see there is one extra elder sibling makes you eight percentage points less likely to go to university. Income in your first job goes down by about a thousand. And you also do worse on a range of other outcomes. So these are quite substantial, but they're not far out from the rest of the literature. Now, if we look at how birth order affects your spouse PSEA, um, just in a bivariate regression, it's negative, but not significant. We throw in a couple of other things, and that remains true. But if you throw in parents' age at birth, obviously, if you have more elder siblings, you also have el older parents. And those two things go in opposite directions. Because older parents is generally good for your outcomes. You know, they're, they're, they're richer, maybe they're wiser. So once we control for that, suddenly the effect of birth order jumps up, becomes significant. And you can see that indeed an elder sibling lowers your spouse's polygenic score. Now we're going to throw in the mediators and we're going to see if we can get rid of that effect. So the, the first column here is the same as what I just showed you. That negative effect of birth order, which is significant. In the second column, I throw in university and some other mediators. You can see that indeed, me going to university is highly predictive. Also, what you can see is that the effect of birth order vanishes. It goes down by a tenfold or so and becomes insignificant. And the same is true if I instead control for income or if I throw in both university and income. And if I look at the percentage of birth order effects that are accounted by these mediators, what you can see is that uh, University is really doing a lot of work. Income is doing a bit of work, and the others are sort of all doing, you know, 10% or a bit less. All right, I guess I should sort of be out of time by now. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rush through this very quickly. Um, we, we got some pushback from people saying, oh, well, it's only barely significant. I knew this thing was significant. It was, it's very robust. So but we went to Norway, and the great thing is with the Norway data, we get about 10 times as many people, spouse pairs. This is the same picture as from the last slide, but just with the Norway data. And again, you can see that an extra elder sibling lowers your spouse's polygenic score. Um, and then the, that, that effect is shrunk when you control for SES mediators like university and income. And if I look at the birth order effects, one thing to notice is that while university still does a lot in Norway, which is, I guess, a more egalitarian society than the UK, income doesn't seem to do anything at all. So that already just suggests, this is very, very early stuff, but it suggests that in different societies, the, the structure of social genetic assortative mating is different. And then that can affect the, uh, the correlation between SES and genetics. Okay, um, there we go. That's my, my, my basic story. The, the most important thing here is, is this. Um, genes are biological. Yeah, they, they affect your, you know, 
what happens to you via, you know, creating creating proteins in in the cells, and that affects your body. But across genetic uh, across generations, genetic variation is a social outcome, just like anything else. Um, and given that results from human genetics are likely to continue to be controversial, it might help to just take the perspective that I take, which is that genes are not really that different from any other thing that social scientists study. They're endogenous to society. Thank you very much. Great, we have 10 minutes or so for questions. We have a mic here so that people online can hear you. Who's up first? Hello, um, I'm Gracie. Thank you all so much for this fabulous presentation. It was a wonderful suite of presentations. This question is for Jonathan, actually. Um, so very interesting. I was fascinated by what you were talking about, and I absolutely see the implications of what you were getting to and how that is potentially quite grave. Um, I had three sort of additional factors I wanted to ask you to consider. And uh, bear with me, because although I have been mentored by several fabulous economist, I remain a sociologist. So um, first of all, the way you presented this, um, the presumption is that PGIs eventually become somewhat universal. Yes. Okay. So just within the context of general preventative care and health, you know, we know that people with more resources tend to be more invested in their health. And we, you know, actually touching on what David just mentioned, we know that culturally we tend to think of genes being highly deterministic. So how do you like think about the fact that people who might be over purchasing their uh, insurance, so to speak, who might be at higher risk may also be the people who have the most resources to address it and to decrease their risk? Um, so I guess that's yeah. the first question. I mean, yeah, th this is, of course, this is a model, so mm -hmm. it's, it, it won't capture the whole breadth of possible uh, human behavior in there. So yes, you're right that there, there there's more that we could do to to adjust like behavior like correlation between behavior adjustment and this but but i think the big first order thing we study still probably is likely to prevail but like people who are i mean if you looked at the graph i didn't have time to emphasize that but for prostate cancer some people get a predicted risk of zero mm -hmm. and it's pretty striking like zero like i mean like it's and of course there's some error around this but those people if they know that why would they buy this insurance and with future projects, so I didn't show this, but some people get a, uh, the pr a predicted risk of like 80 or 90%. It's pretty striking. Even if you do behavioral adjustment, if you know that your predicted risk of getting prostate cancer is going to be 80%, uh, you might still be safe and want to buy more insurance. Like uh, So, so yeah, so, so that's the, uh, I would say, yeah, that's the main answer. Yeah, I agree there's more nuance we could factor in, but yeah, we try to focus on the big first order element. Fair enough. And do you, do you have an idea of how these things could be baked into economics models in the future? Or? Um, would, what do you mean? Well, like, how would you account? I, I know that often the behavioral, yeah, yeah, behavioral yeah. or environmental. Yeah, you could factor in, uh, adjust the risk, like make a, a choice behavior, a choice like model consumer behavior based on their, like you know, you. A typical economic modeling where you still function, factor your risk, and based on that, you adjust your behavior and that effect. But yeah, it would take much more data to model how to model all this and to estimate that. Okay. Thank you so yeah. much for your time. I appreciate yeah. it. I'm Patrick um, Turley. Um, I have a question for you, David. Um, so two two questions which are hopefully quick um the, the first one is about you you have your mediation analyses where you do cross-country comparisons and also comparisons across these different factors um have you tried to put standard errors on those estimates um because just doing the back of the envelope calculations I, my sense is that they'd be quite wide and and difficult to make comparisons like that What's the second question? Oh, the second one is about the theory. It's unrelated at all. I mean, so your model of attractiveness seems to seems to assume that there's some sort of homogeneous um, model of preferences over genes and, and SES. And I was wondering if you thought about um, how heterogeneous preferences over those two things um, might affect uh, the um, like the results of your model. 
Okay, right, yeah, two, two very different questions. Um, uh, about the standard errors, I mean, as you probably know, when you're trying to create standard errors from um, a ratio, it's a horrible and ugly econometric problem. And so I just cowardly avoided it. But you are right. I mean, first of all, just in terms of the standard errors, but also we've got different samples between these two countries. We have different measures. Right now, we're still using EA3 in the UK and EA4 in Norway. Now, we're hopefully going to, we're going to do everything we can to try and make these two things comparable. It's still going to be a very broad and more of a suggestive result. So I, I don't want to oversell it. I, I think the fact that essentially income does nothing in Norway and it clearly does something in the UK is interesting. But that's all I would want to say. Um, about attractiveness, uh, like, uh, should, should, there, should there be heterogeneity in the model? Well, I mean, you know, of course, right? Because we, you know, what, what really matters is, is the mating assortative. So, the, you know, you can have assortative mating because everyone agrees on what's attractive and then the attractive people couple off. Or you can have it like, you know, when, when Republicans won't marry Democrats and vice versa, like in, in, in this benighted country. Um, it, that, that, that can have the same effect, right? Just in terms of the outcome, you just get Republicans with Republicans, you know, people who score highly on the trait and then people who score low on the trait. So in that sense, it might not matter that much. But of course, you can imagine making these models as complex as you want, and that would be interesting. Hi, Kyle Barassa, Durham BA. This is a question for David as well. Speaking of complexity of the models, I was curious, I might have just missed it. I know you had to go pretty quick to get through them. I was curious about the question of birth order. Uh, I'm a social scientist myself, so I do think of social sort of explanations, but also second children, third children generally decrease in height, for example, compared to the firstborn. So there might be something going on biologically in terms of you know, being a second, third, fourth child. I was curious if there's a way that you could potentially model that and include that in order to account for some of that correlation that might be going on with birth order, not related to social, uh, social sort of explanations of parental involvement or whatever. Um, but again, it might already be in the models, so I'm just curious. We, we do indeed include, we, we've got height as a control. We include BMI, and that's explicitly because some of what birth order does isn't going to be SES related. I mean, if it were, it would be great. We could use this perfect instrument, but realistically, all we can do is throw in potential mediators. We won't have, have all of them. We've got height, BMI, IQ, which is a little bit of a conservative control because IQ is sort of partly because that affects SES. Um, and we have self-rated health in the UK. But there could always be others. And so ultimately, what we're sort of saying is, look, the effect of education here in particular looks very big. And it would intuitively take a hell of a lot of non-SES mediators to be correlated with it before you would knock it out. And given what we know about how people mate assortatively on education, it seems very plausible that that's what's going on here. A quick question for Marza. I'm not sure what your, uh, what your purpose was on the Mendelian randomization, whether you're trying to like be the final death knell of it or, or not, because it's been, it's had so many lives, I think, and so many problems that then generate a, a, the next way of doing the analysis. I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about your future here, if you're trying to do that last hammer in the coffin, nail in the coffin or something different. Thank you for the question. Um, the purpose of this was to highlight a potential problem with, with MR that comes from a sort of mating that we've seen and uh, no one has really highlighted before, uh, but there are others that are not related to a sort of mating that we don't touch upon in the paper. But that was really the purpose. I'm not sure if last name in the coffin. Um, so you're, you're envisioning that there'll be a, a total fix to it in MR Edgar 7, you know, or whatever. And Patrick's shaking his head, but maybe, maybe uh, do you have a, a strong view on this, Marta? Um, I don't personally have a strong view. Do you mean on, on MR or? On the use of MR, uh, whether, 
well, maybe this maybe generate a, a second prong here because you focus so much on education, which might be a great case of a failure. There might be a, a lot of other domains where this wouldn't be as important. I, I'm wondering if that's going to be the response from the MR crowd, or if you have other thoughts on the uh, continued survival of MR. <laughs> This is mostly just to let, have Patrick laugh for a little while. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, uh, no, I don't really have final thoughts for, for MR. It's just to say when there's sorting, be wary. That's, okay. that's it. Thank you. Very, very, very nice answer. So we're just delighted that uh, Kathy Harris is here to uh, give our keynote, our first uh, keynote address in our conference series. And we were just really happy she said yes and had some trials and tribulations of coming up here, so we're happy she's here. Um, so as many of you know, Kathy has been one of the most prominent supporters, leaders, doers in the field of biodemography and social genomics. I'll just call out her directorship of, at, of the Ad Health study that she pioneered the collection and analysis of a broad range of biomarkers, and, has, and importantly, has really prioritized getting these data in the hands of us uh, to use ourselves. and. Um, and also in, has been a leader in situating the use and, mis, and calling out misuse of these data in her uh, academic publications. Many of you also know that she's among the best and most productive mentors of this next generation. So we're just particularly thrilled that she's here to provide you know, additional mentoring uh, while she's here and to give her keynote address about, about Ad Health, which is Ad Health in the Age of Social uh, Genomics. So please help me uh, welcome Kathy. Great, thank you. Hello, everybody. It's really uh, great. I'm honored that Jason asked me to uh, speak at this um, first conference. I'm not sure what we're going to call it. Um, probably came up earlier this morning. <laughs> um, but anyway, thanks very much. Um, so yeah, I'm going to, well, here's, did that work? Yeah, perfect. This is uh, what I'm going to talk about today. Um, first, uh, why genetics um, in ad health. Uh, and then I'm gonna sort of zip through, give you some background on the ad health uh, design, the types of data, and then spend some time on the uh, history of genetic data and some of the findings. I'll give you some uh, illustrative examples of the findings. And then if time, um, I'll end with uh, some of future scientific opportunities in social genomics and ad health. So, um, so what, what is ad health? Um, let's see. I, I know the answer to that. I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to make sure um, that I can see my notes here, which I can't, which is okay. Um, okay, so uh, ad health, uh, I'll tell you, was developed in the early 1990s, but the question that it wanted, that it wanted to address is, uh, how does the social environment of young people affect their health and health behavior? Um, and then to answer that question, okay. so there it goes. Uh, so to answer that question um, on the importance of the social environment in health, we built Ad Health as a multi-level longitudinal study design. Um, and it had direct measurement of the social context of adolescent life, um, and that included the, the school, the community, the neighborhood, uh, the peer networks, friendships, uh, romantic relationships, family, and so on. It has unprecedented racial and uh, ethnic diversity um, through oversamples of specific ethnic groups, um, and it has a genetically informed sibling sample, um, 3,000 pairs of adolescents that were part of the original design. And then over time, um, it's included extensive biomarker collection across all the waves. Hmm. So, maybe I should use the clicker. I've been using these. You want, you want the stagger? Yeah. Can you make the notes full, like larger on her screen? Oh, what, other, yeah. 
but I am actually not seeing the notes. I'm just seeing the next slide. Hold on, folks. Oh, so I don't have any notes there. Okay. Oh, he's come. come. Can, you, can you make the notes much larger? Oh, it's on. Oh, it's showing you both. Okay, we can fix that. Good. Now it's clicking these arrows, but they don't. You need it this way. Oh yeah, that's and right. And there you go. Yep. And then the arrows should. The arrows should work. And then the notes will come. That's that's what I was seeing on yours. Okay. Hmm. The arrows are not working, but the big green button will for you. This one. Yep. Hmm. Okay, what is going on? Hmm. Let me advance them that way. Let me just well, relaunch. Uh, <laughs> let, let me just relaunch it real quick. Okay. Oh, now the arrows are working. Okay. Yeah, glitch in the matrix. <laughs> okay, this works. Yeah, but then the big green button will work. Either way, it works. The big green button progresses, and that's the thing. Okay. Okay, great. All right. Okay, so again, the purpose of Ad Health was really to understand how the social environment affected health and health behavior among young people. And so we built Ad Health to. Um... Okay, great. Okay, so, but why genetics in Ad Health? Well, as I just mentioned, the original design included uh, an embedded genetic pair sample. Um, so from the start, uh, we uh, um, were interested in including the role of, of genetics in health and health behavior. But remember, our, our main purpose was to understand how the social environment was important for health. And so our goal was really to try to control for uh, genetic variants to better isolate and get a better estimate of the role of the social environment, which is often confounded with uh, genetic influence. <clears throat> As time went on and there became new innovative techniques to collect biological specimens in a field setting, um, which Ad Health is, um, so we were collecting data in the homes of adolescents or sometimes at their workplace, or sometimes we met them at a McDonald's. And um, in, we were in every single state in the US. Um, we were then able to uh, collect biological specimens and integrate biology into the data collection design and, and the research. And again, the goal at this point, my goal, was uh, convincing uh, the biomedical field on the importance of social factors in health. And I felt that if we included valid um, measures um, of biology or biological markers of health risk and modeled biological processes to understand how what happens outside the body affects what happens inside the body, then we could elevate our findings on the importance of the social environment. And then we added molecular uh, and genomic data, again, as time went on and new techniques uh, became available um, and uh, the technology for creating high dimensional data were possible. And again, the goal at this point was to discover how the social exposures you know, interact with and operate through genetic pathways that affect health. And I think in the incorporation of the biological data, the health risk data, the biomarkers, um, Ad Health is a, a study of adolescents who have been followed into, at this point, their um, uh, near uh, middle, midlife. And, um, you know, so young people are pretty healthy, at least they are thought to be healthy. And it was really important for us to motivate theoretically, um, you know, what biological measures of health we were included. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the studies, uh, aging studies, you know, sort of had a, an easier argument to make because as you get old, uh, you get your risk of disease is high um, and you experience more, more morbidity. But young people are pretty healthy. So we really had to theoretically argue uh, for what were the 
uh, what were the prevalent health risks for young people at the time? And um, were there biological measures that could capture those health risks? And did those biological measures um, operate in processes that were related to the social environment? And did they cause future disease? So we were one of the only studies I was told by my uh, NIH uh, program officer that really theoretically argued for the inclusion of the, uh, the biological data that we included in Ad Health. When the genomic data came along, it was a little bit different. So I've, I've argued and written that, you know, you should include biological measures in social demographic studies, um, not because you can, but, you know, uh, um, but for a specific theoretical reason. But I think with the genetic data, um, we really did include it because we could. And I think that that opened up a different avenue of thinking about, about discovery. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so a little bit of background, I'm gonna zip through this. Um, I know many of you are familiar with that health, um, but I know some people are not. Uh, so the full name of the study is National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Health. It's a program project that began in 1994. It's actually responded to a congressional mandate uh, to fund a study of adolescent health. There wasn't much research on, adolescent, um, on health, um, adolescents or their health. Uh, it's a national representative uh, study of adolescents in grades 7 through 12, 1994. They've now been followed for about 30 years uh, to middle adulthood. So that's the population that Ad Health represents. Uh, there are the five ways of data were funded by NICHD as a program project. Um, with co-funding from 23 uh, other federal agencies and foundations. And uh, Wave 6 is uh, funded now by NIA as a UO1 um, in 2021, and that's um, currently in the field. So most of the, most of the data I'm going to show you is going to come up to Wave 5. Here's the design of Ad Health. Um, you can see that... Um, the waves uh, across the first column uh, and their dates and response rates. Um, <clears throat> uh, so wave one, it's uh, Ad Health was a school-based study. We selected um, 80 high schools and a, a companion feeder or junior high school in 80 communities. We went into those schools on a particular day and administered a brief survey. And that, that creates uh, the school data. It's about 90,000 uh, students. These are a census of the school. Um, and then we sampled from the school rosters um, was a stratified uh, gender and grade stratified sample of adolescents, um, about 2,000 students per school, as well as a parent. And um, we uh, then interviewed a much longer interview for about, about 90 minutes um, for, of that adolescent and a parent. In wave two, we followed up a year later, um, re-interviewed the adolescents. We did not follow up the seniors, so the sample size went down a little bit at wave two. And that was just a, a, um, a design decision based on, on cost. <laughs> we have information at the school from the school administrator. And let's see if I can make sure I... Oh, it's almost easier to go up here. And this is the biomarker collection that we've done over time. So we've gotten... Uh, uh, height and weight at each wave, and we repeated that. This is actually self-reported at wave one, but from that point on, we measure as well as self-report. Um, wave three, we came back about five years later. The sample's going through the transition to adulthood. Um, they were um, 18 to 26. A little harder to find them, um, but we still had a fairly respectable response rate. And uh, the biomarkers that we collected at that time, we repeated height and weight, um, but because at the time, which is uh, 2001, 02, um, this, was the, um, uh, this age group was experiencing the highest rates of uh, sexually transmitted infections and HIV. So we collected urine to test for um, uh, STIs and um, saliva to test for HIV. <clears throat> we also collected buccal cell DNA from the genetic sample, and I'll obviously talk a lot more about that. And then wave four, about four or five years later, 
they're now settling pretty much into adulthood. They're 24 to 32. Um, and this was the, the wave in which I uh, greatly expanded sort of the biological data that we collected. Um, it's probably hard to see, especially for those in the back where I just was. But we have markers of uh, metabolic immune uh, inflammation, cardiovascular um, functioning, uh, as well as medications. We also uh, got candidate genes. And then we collected saliva in the full sample that uh, was able to create GWAS data. And then wave four occurred in uh, 2016 to 2018. Um, they're now moving through their 30s. The average age was 38 at wave five. And um, our, the sample size goes down because in wave five, we made a transition to a web survey. Um, all the other waves were in person. Again, this was a, a cost decision that was imposed on us by a funder. Um, so uh, what we did is we actually um, sampled non-respondents uh, so that we have a representative sample, but a smaller N. Um, and we added a couple biomarkers at Wave 5, um, some renal markers um, of um, kidney disease, and we've uh, gotten medication. And this is also when we expanded our genomic uh, collection, which I'll tell you about in a sec. Um, and I should mention... We have a follow-up of the parent. I'll talk about that a little bit, too. Here's another way of looking at it over time. You know, wave one and wave two occurred in adolescence, and then wave three, four, and five kind of spread up, um, over young adulthood. Okay. Okay, types of data. These are the types of data. I'll show you. These, this is the survey data that comes from the questionnaire. You can see the main domains. Um, some, some domains um, uh, uh, pop up uh, later um, in the cohort's life course as they become developmentally relevant. Some go away. Uh, we have an extensive amount of contextual data. Uh, the original PO1 in 1994 had, had its own R01 for collecting contextual data. So, you know, we have all the census data that are linked to the um, respondents' um, address and um, geocodes, but we also have data from, you know, the CDC and uh, crime statistics, National Center of Health Statistics, some denominational data. And then, of course, there's the school-level data. And then, um, you know, within the questionnaire, we have network data, romantic pairs data, friendship nominations, so on. Over time, we, you know, kept adding more contextual data. We have a huge data set on um, the obesity and uh, neighborhood environment. Uh, the Ad, Ad Health cohort was born in the late 70s and early 80s, so this was just at the onset of the obesity epidemic. So the so obesity is a, is a big factor, um, and in fact, the, the number one health risk for this cohort. Other policy level data, um, information on military service, climate, pollution, uh, college characteristics, um, and so on. We've collected um, birth records of the respondents and their children in a few states. We're trying to continue that. We also have a death surveillance project um, where we get the death certificates to find out to get the cause of death and the circumstances of death. Here's the cognitive data, uh, just to let you know. Um, so we have an um, adapted picture of vocabulary score that we collected at wave one. We repeated it at wave three. In wave four, then we added some memory measures um, that we also repeated at wave five. And um, wave six uh, is um, expanding a little bit more on, these, on the cognitive measures to include um, executive function and, and, and so on. Okay, so I'm where I want to be and spend some time uh, uh, telling you about the genomic data. Uh, so as I mentioned, I mean, from the original design, um, we had uh, included uh, the ability to um, uh, isolate uh, genetic effects. Um, we um, also collected buccal cell DNA um, uh, across waves uh, two, three, and four, actually, for candidate genes. Um, and let me see. Oops. Oh, I see. Um, so, sorry. Uh, so we the buccal cell DNA we collected in wave three from the um, 
the full SIBs um, and the twin sample. And then uh, we also collected uh, saliva for candidate genes at wave uh, four from the full sample. Uh, the GWAS was based on that saliva collection, um, but, but we, um, it wasn't part of the program project so that we had to get consent to archive their saliva samples for future testing. And uh, that's what the, the GWAS data are based on. Uh, we were able to, we had about 10,000 uh, who consented to archive. And then at wave five, we added some additional cases um, based on venous blood. Uh, the gene expression data, uh, the, re the remaining data were collected at wave uh, five. Uh, we have gene, uh, gene expression data, which uh, is a, uh, a collect, uh, we have PAX gene samples. Um, and uh, we have, it's about on 5,000 cases. These are, the, are, these are individuals who consented to the blood draw. Remember that wave five was a, a web survey. So through the web survey, we uh, had to get consent for a follow-up visit in the home. So the sample size goes down a little bit. We have methylation data on that same 5,000. And again, that's, that's based on venous blood, um, use the uh, EPIC array. And then we also have microbiome data. Uh, we, have a, we have a small pilot that I embedded at wave five. It's just a, it's a feasibility study, see if people would self-collect this with a kit uh, that we left with them. And then we have a, an actual funded uh, study from the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. That's currently in the field. Okay. So let's see. I think when I touch the screen, the arrows go away. Hmm. Uh, okay, he just showed me. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so I'm going to go through some of the genetic data um, and uh, talk about it and then show you some examples. Got it. All right, so um, the oversample of genetic pairs in the adult design. Um, you know, we, uh, we oversampled uh, twins, MZ, DZ twins, every twin that we found, we, we included. Um, full sibs appear in, in, in large numbers um, naturally, but we oversampled half sibs. We oversampled adolescents who lived in the same household but had no genetic uh, resemblance. Um, so some these are foster uh, kids. We have uh, a lot of um, adopted. We have a pretty big adoptive sample. You can identify cousins. It's really it's it's quite rich. Um, and again, you know, the purpose at that time was to control for genetic variance um, in order to sort of isolate the environmental effects, which was what we cared about. And then, you know, a perfect example is, you know, parental effects on children, um, you know, trying to, you know, sort of uh, eliminate that genetic variance. I mean, it's still very difficult because uh, you know, this is bi-directional and parents affect kids and kids affect parents. But these sort of sibling twin models really were the gold standard for us being differences between individuals who share genes and share a common context, but vary on individual attributes. And I see there's a session uh, coming up on this. <laughs> okay. Um, so, you know, these used basic BG models. At the time, it was a fairly crude methodology. You couldn't really explore mechanisms. Um, but nevertheless, um, you know, there are hundreds of peer-reviewed articles using BG methods. And in fact, it produced some of the first uh, gene environment interactions. So here is one of the first ones. Um, this is by uh, David Rowe. He was one of the co-investigators on the wave one uh, PO1 on ad health. Uh, this was published in, in 1999. Uh, and this shows the uh, um, relationship between, uh, it's a G by E. Uh, e is at the time parents education. Uh, or SES, um, if you think broadly. <clears throat> and, you know, what, what you see here is that when, uh, when parents' education is low, uh, when the environment is what you might consider um, more adverse socioeconomically, um, then you, the shared environment uh, is more important and uh, um, heritability is dampened. And then as uh, the environment improves with higher uh, parents' education, then 
that tends to foster the genetic potential. I mean, this was incredibly important at the time because remember the speaker before, you know, mentioned, you know, what uh, that, you know, sort of advocating for half of the faculty in a social, social department should be a geneticist. <clears throat> you know, at the time, you know, um, you know, sociologists really were, uh, were taking a big risk, you know, mentioning the word genetics. Um, and, you know, and the reason is because I thought that, uh, you know, if anybody said, oh, but what about, you know, what's the role of genes, then, uh, then the notion that, that this was hardwired and you couldn't do anything. But, so this is a perfect example of how, um, you know, intervention in the environment can change um, how um, a child, um, you know, uh, potential um, in verbal vocabulary. Okay. Okay, so uh, this was another really, I think, cool article at the time um, that looks at uh, correlations uh, between um, individuals who, who share genes. Uh, and so you can see, you know, we've got the twins and the SIDS, um, and, and then those who you know, don't share their genes, but who share a common context, uh, like friends, neighbors, uh, grade mates. And, uh, you know, you can see that this was a, it was just a really fun sort of article where, uh, or analysis, uh, uh, where, you know, some of these traits, of course, are more heritable than others, uh, you know, height, cognitive ability, and it's just a cascading of the importance of these sort of correlations um, across, uh, across these pairs according to the genes shared. So they go down when you get into the context that less genes are being shared by these individuals. Uh, you see somewhat the same with cognitive ability, whereas in delinquency, I mean, there's, you know, the correlations are higher, of course, for the twins, but, you know, they quickly sort of dissipate. The cognitive ability genes are, um, sorry, the cognitive ability correlations um, are still pretty high um, among adolescents who share the same context, which reflects uh, probably some of the, uh, the selection that's going on. Okay. So, okay. Let's have to... All right. Okay, so the second sort of set of genetic data is the molecular data. We were really one of the first studies to collect DNA in a national field settings. Uh, we started actually in 1996 because um, the zygosity, the way we determine zygosity uh, for the, the twins is based on sort of a standard set of survey questions. You know, do your parents confuse you? Do others confuse you? And so on. But it was never quite clear for, uh, um, for a small subset. So we made our own DNA kits and uh, collected zygosity on 89 twin pairs. Um, what was really interesting was that for some of them, you know, their parents and everybody thought that they were identical, uh, when in fact the zygosity showed that they were fraternal. And then of course, vice versa for a small, you know, a small handful. And um, that's a really um, interesting analysis. Actually, Dalton Conley wrote a paper on this. I'm not sure if he ever published it, but you know, it just really, it showed the, uh, the importance of the environment where, you know, parents who were raising um, uh, Z DZ twins but thought that they were MZ, identical, um, when in fact they really were fraternal, they looked more, more alike um, than actual uh, MZ twins and vice versa. Um, but then in wave three, we collected the molecular data on the, the twins and the full sibs. Uh, we used a sort of, uh, David Rowe developed this kit using a mouthwash. There was no or gene at the time. And we uh, assayed for uh, KNA genes and the dopamine and serotonin pathways. Uh, you know, the interest these were adolescents were really interested in, in risk behavior. Released the data in 2003. Um, and so it really created the opportunity for some of the first molecular data in the social science field. And we have, you know, there's a lot of articles that are out using this. Let me show you some examples. So um, this is one of my favorite uh, examples. You might recognize uh, the author, some of the authors. Um, and you know, this was a study that was interested in um, you know, this notion that uh, people who became friends 
you know, uh, that there was this selection that, that you tend to uh, select your friend um, you know, based on similar characteristics. And so obviously some of those characteristics are going to be related to genes. So what, um, you know, what these authors did was think, well, there could be, there could be another explanation for that. And so um, they, you know, really addressed this notion of uh, genetic homophilia for um, uh, the, uh, polymor polymorphism within the, the DRD2 gene and found that it was actually stronger in schools uh, with greater levels of inequality. Uh, so friends look more alike um, in, in this polymorphism uh, that, uh, and, and so their, the structure of the schools then sort of moderated the role of genes in friendship um, formation. Uh, so the schools that had higher levels of inequality, like tracking, for example, friends shared more genes um, because they were you know, placed in environments where they were uh, more similar. In the schools that were less structured, then genes played less of a role, that friends um, uh, um, share fewer genes. Oops, I'm not sure. Let me see if I can go back. Um, so, yeah, in conclusion, then the you know, individuals with similar genotypes may not actually actively select into friendships, but rather they may be sort of placed into these contexts. Okay. All right, now let me see if I can move to the next one. Okay, next example. Um, this is another really great example, I think, uh, of a gene by environment interaction using candidate genes. Um, this is work with my colleague Guang Guo. Um, and it's, it addressed a gene by life course, which is measured by age interaction, which is a nice interaction because birth date is random. And uh, was focusing on this sort of evidence that there's this protective effect um, that is consistently related to the 9R9R genotype and the dopamine transporter gene, the DIT1, uh, with an array of sort of risky uh, behaviors. Um, and what we found there here was that, um, that age really moderated the genetic effects associated with risk behavior, and that this was explained by the legal or the so sort of social sanctions that are tied to age. So again, you know, trying to identify the role of the social environment. Um, and you know, the two examples here are um, that are, um, I can't read it. Um, okay, sorry, drinking quantity, <laughs> uh, which you see is um, that, that there's really, the 9R9R, when drinking is illegal under age 21, uh, the lower uh, line is uh, those with the 9R9R genotype, they're much less likely to drink. As soon as uh, they pass age 21 or so, there's no longer a difference. The other really important one was seatbelt use. And you know, what you see is that there's no difference between uh, those of the 9R9R um, uh, versus uh, any 10R. But as soon as they, uh, the cohort turns 16, those 9R9R nine nine folks are wearing their seatbelt. Uh, so it's, and, and we found similar sort of findings with, with other, uh, with binge drinking um, and smoking. Okay. Okay. Um, and keep an eye on the time here. You know, this is a, a classic example of a gene by environment interaction. Uh, it shows that. Um, Genes are moderating the environmental influence in adolescence um, regarding this notion of genetic sensitivity to sort of peer behaviors. So it really sort of addresses this hypothesis that individuals with the SS allele on the serotonin transporter gene, the 5-HTTLPR uh, gene, are more susceptible to their environments. And you know, this is looking at alcohol use. You see that on the left-hand side when uh, the prevalence of alcohol use in a school is low, then the individuals with the SS um, allele drink less than those with the LL allele. But as soon as the prevalence in the school increases, they tend to drink more. So the, the notion of sort of sensitivity to their environment. 
All right. Okay, I'm using the wrong thing here. Um, so there's a lot of interesting, I'm sure you mainly gain envir uh, environment interactions, because as I mentioned, really interested in, in the role of the social environment here um, in moderating um, uh, genetic um, influence. But of course, there is a lot, you know, there are certain limitations of the, the gene environment interactions. You know, the effects tend to be small um, and unstable. Um, unfortunately, E is often endogenous, so you're always looking for an E that isn't endogenous. And of course, you know, the school environment is, is one such example of an end endogenous um, effect. It also has poor replication. I mean, we tried to replicate other people's findings of gene environment interactions. Uh, didn't always work out too well. Um, and I just think that often the effects are explored without really good theoretical motivation um, or hypothesis testing. All right, but um, I think probably more on that, I think in a, a session coming up later today or tomorrow. Okay, so GWAS data. All right, so the uh, genome-wide association data uh, became available um, after wave four when we collected saliva on the full sample, and then we archived the origin uh, samples. Uh, we, had, we had about 10,000 uh, cases. Um, and then in wave five, we were able to sort of get around the consent issue um, uh, and uh, added um, those who did not consent at wave four, but were agreeable at wave five for us to use their, their venous blood um, for GWAS. And so we added another 1,600. We used uh, two um, chips uh, just because it took so long over time. Uh, number one, to get the money. I mean, Ad Health is, is uh, large. And at the time, it was still pretty expensive um, to be doing the, the genome-wide um, uh, testing. So we combined these tips, uh, chips, uh, results from the chips in terms of the overlap of the genotypes. And then these data are now available through, through dbGaP. And there's the accession code. I think these slides are going to be available if people want to come back. And then, of course, based on the GWAS, we've got a lot of polygenic scores. Um, that we have constructed and continue to update based on GWAS is coming out. Um, we also uh, were fortunate enough to get the polygenic scores from the SSGAC consortium uh, and the recent uh, polygenic index uh, repository. Okay, so here's some of the polygenic scores. These are um, available. You don't have to go to dbGaP for these. We release these on the, on the, on the um, restricted data contracts. These are listed online and you can you know, find them there. We have a second release. We're now you know, we're working on the third release as well. So some examples um, using the polygenic scores. And again, these are, uh, you know, these are some of my favorites. <laughs> Um, we have a couple nice examples of this uh, notion of social genetic effects, that the genes of one's social relations, the friends, classmen, grademates influence your own health and behavior. So again, we're always, you know, my goal is to show the importance of uh, social relations, social environment, social interactions. Um, and uh, so we're, we're able to actually uh, analyze this in Ad Health because respondents nominated their friends in the schools. And many of those friends that were nominated in the schools were also selected for the in-home. And it's only through the in-home sample where uh, we get the, the genetic data. Um, and classmates and grademates, of course, were also part of the perspective um, sample going forward. Um, so here's an, here's an article that shows um, the, um, uh, the influence of genes of schoolmates and friends on education, on one's education, uh, BMI height, um, over and above the influence of one's own genes um, on these phenotypes. Again, these are using, you know, the polygenic scores. Uh, so what you see here are the gray bars uh, is the, that's the, um, that's the influence of your own genes for education, BMI, and height in the three panels. Um, and the blue bars is the influence of schoolmates in the top bar and friends um, genes uh, for education BMI and height, you know, on, the, on these um, outcomes, controlling for one's own genes. Uh, the dashed red line is the baseline effect. 
So in the first panel for education, the gray bars, you know, estimated the effects of the own genes for educational, educational attainment. And then the blue bars are the schoolmates or friends genes controlling for own genes. Um, and, you know, what you can see here is, you know, sort of, you know, what you might expect. Uh, the blue bars are large uh, for education, um, which is, you know, the importance of, um, of the environment for a phenotype like education. People have been talking about smaller for BMI and height. That makes sense. And the schoolmate effects seem to be quite uh, larger than, or a, a little larger than, than those of friends. Another example here is, um, is looking at the social genetic effects of adolescent smoking. Uh, this is cigarettes per day. Um, and here we also find um, large uh, social genetic effects of, of grade mates, genes for smoking, on own smoking, controlling for your own PGS for smoking. <laughs> um, and you can also see there's, it looks like there's an in-degree friends um, uh, significant um, uh, um, association here. And so these in-degree uh, friends are, are those um, who nominate you as a friend. Again, I like this because you know, uh, uh, you know, grade fit, you know, grade mates are assumed to be random for the most part, you know, based on birth, on birth date. Okay. Okay. Just have to hit about twenty times. All right, transcriptome data. So, you know, these data, you know, are are brand new, uh, based on uh, venum puncture whole blood samples collected uh, through the Pax gene RNA tubes at wave five. Uh, we do RNA seq data. Sample size, you know, earlier I said it's about five thousand, but after all the quality control checks, we end up with about forty five hundred. Uh, we're actually going to disseminate this gene expression data this summer. Um, we'll put it right out there with um, dbGaP, um, and you know. We uh, like the polygenic scores and some other data. Um, you know, we may be able to do, uh, uh, create a transcriptome age, you know, based on other, other work that other people are doing uh, going on right now that we would release as part of the contract. So again, these data are brand new. We're really, uh, it's quite preliminary. Um, we're trying to make sense of it. Um, but, you know, the goal remains the same. You know, how are social factors social environment, you know, life course experiences related to, to gene expression. Okay. So here's an example. Uh, we start with SES, fundamental social status. Uh, see how it is associated with disease signatures um, of gene expression um, in ad health. Um, the disease signatures are sort of defined by uh, clusters of genes that are based on prior evidence of genes that are related to specific diseases. Um, and then we use the messenger RNA abundance levels to sort of compute the co um, composite scores. On, on, the, uh, on A, the A side, these are just the statistical um, uh, significant associations between the different measures of adult SES and the disease um, signatures. Uh, and you can see that we have measured SES um, by education, income, occupation, and then we also have subjective social status, and then a composite. The composite is just of education, occupation, um, and um, income. And then the 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 you know the size of the of the circles uh, reveal the the significance of the um, the level of significance. So it's you know it's a probability on the log ten scale. Um, Okay, let's see. So you find that, you know, there's really quite strong associations, um, especially for income, and interestingly, subjective social status, and of course the composite, which combines all, um, with these uh, disease signatures. Now remember these disease signatures are, you know, uh, gene expression um, that is um, based on uh, more sort of future disease. I mean, the one advantage of using ad health is that um, we can try to identify, you know, health risks or pathways that are leading to disease 
before disease is manifest, which you know, promotes the idea that we can intervene to sort of change some of those, some of those pathways. On the um, B, what we see here is, okay, I can't get this. Um, so what this shows is we've used um, like enriched pathway analysis to sort of understand the functional significance of genes in these uh, clusters, the significant clusters, and then sort of determine, you know, the up and down regulate clusters of genes associated uh, with uh, SES. And, you know, as you can see, there's in the composite, you have, uh, you have an array of both uh, upregulated as well as downregulated. Um, for the individual items, you see something different. Um, and I forgot to mention, if you can't see, what these disease signatures are for, it's just Alzheimer's, asthma, um, uh, chronic kidney disease, uh, COPD, cardiovascular depression, diabetes, hypertension, and rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so really, you know, what we find is that there's really a diverse range of biological processes that are both up and down regulated, suggesting that SEA, SES perturbs um, many of the biological systems that are involved in, in chronic diseases. Um, but again, the, the, the key here, the, the, the importance of this finding is that, you know, these, in, that we're, these inequalities in molecular risk for chronic disease are evident in, uh, you know, sort of uh, young, later young adulthood and um, early midlife. All right, so epigenetic data, you know, they're... Um, is overwhelming evidence really that indicates that the epigenome serves to instruct uh, the unique gene expression program in each cell type together, you know, with its uh, genome. Um, so we were really excited about the epigenetic data. Uh, we did the methylation analysis using the venous blood. Um, we use the EPIC chip. Uh, our sample size is again about 4,500 um, after QC. And um, we've constructed measures of epigenetic age and age acceleration from the, D the uh, DNA methylation ca uh, calculator. And we will disseminate, again, these, these clocks and you know, pace of aging types of measures probably next year um, around this time. So here's uh, some examples. All right. And again, you know, the, the goal is to understand how social factors here, education and race ethnicity, are related to biological aging. In this example, that's measured by um, the Grim Age clock. And uh, what you see is that, I mean, the findings are, are pretty consistent, that socioeconomic status is strongly associated with epigenetic aging, that higher levels of educational attainment are associated with slower, epigenetic aging. And, you know, this is, you know, so the no college has uh, an older epigenetic age for Asians, Blacks, not so much for Hispanics, but, but also, um, but definitely for whites. Uh, we find something similar with income in terms of, of poverty. And then by way of validation, uh, we sort of examined how these, uh, how epigenetic aging was associated with uh, with multiple disease outcomes um, or, or, or health uh, disease risk uh, in early midlife. Uh, the adult cohort, so this is wave five, average age 38. Um, and here we're showing results from, the, from multiple clocks. And um, we find that, that these associations are strongest for metabolic disease risk here, uh, obesity and inflammation. And we have the Horvath, which is the first generation clock, and then uh, Fino age and Grim age, uh, the second uh, generation. And, um, you know, basically the, the finding is that an older epigenetic age, biological age, is associated with higher risks of, um, of these, of obesity and inflammation. And, you know, it's, it's interesting to see the behavior of the clocks. You get a, you get a, you know, uh, a steeper slope um, with the second generation clocks, a stronger sort of relationship, which, um, is probably related to uh, the data set on which these clocks uh, were trained and what they're predicting in terms of mortality versus um, 
um, I, I, sorry, in terms of chronological, chronological age versus mortality and morbidity. But this is what we want to see. All right, the last genomic data uh, in ad health is microbiome data. And as I mentioned, we embedded a, a pilot at wave, at wave five. We have about 700 um, samples. Uh, we collected both oral and, and uh, fecal samples, um, but we mainly are just been using the fecal samples. Um, just to test the feasibility. Turned out to be feasible. Uh, we have a funded study that's in the field right now. We're hoping to get about 2,000 um, cases. Um, and then these uh, were prepared for 16S, um, the R RNA analysis. And then from the sequencing data, um, we assign the relative abundance of each of the bacterial species to each sample. And then we can calculate the alpha and beta diversity and examine how diversity varies by social and behavioral uh, factors. Um, you know, I think like, like GWAS, which when we mapped the genome, thought was going to give us the answers to um, all disease risks and pathways. The same is being said about microbiome. And scientists are only just now discovering the enormous impact of our gut health, how it could hold the key to everything from tackling obesity to overcoming anxiety and um, boosting immunity. There was a recent article in Nature showing um, the brain-gut re relationship in terms of explaining the mechanisms related to um, irritable bowel syndrome and, and other sorts of diseases. So there's a lot of excitement around the, around the microbiome. And it kind of echoes back to, you know, why, why do we collect microbiome data? And it's really about, um, about discovery and really understanding how, you know, what's happening uh, outside our bodies and um, our behaviors with regard to the environment affects what happens inside. So uh, some examples, um, you know, we're just starting, we're just starting to work on that, on that pilot um, data, uh, data set. And here's an example uh, from those uh, 700 or so cases. It's like kind of a heat map of the, um, the bacteria uh, phyla by social demographic and behavioral characteristics. I'm not sure people can see these. It's really small. Um, but for example, what you see here is that um, this says this is for smokers. So people who use tobacco have, you know, more of these bacteria. <laughs> uh, and I've got them uh, RF39. Pastor, whoever is a microbiologist, please excuse my pronunciation. Um, Pastor Otilalasis and other, other bacteria. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, same with like household income. So it gives you what the dis distribution of these bacteria are for people who fall into these different categories of social uh, and behavioral um, uh, uh, factors. And the other thing that you can find is that some of the exposures associate with the same bacteria phyla. Uh, for example, use of alcohol and use of tobacco. Here's, here's a smoker and alcohol, you know, seem to be somewhat similar. Okay. All right. This is a, another example. Um, this doesn't come from Ad Health. Uh, these data come from a different study. Um, this also included 700 adults over the age of 18, um, but in 20 different countries, four different continents, and it's also based on fecal samples. And their main interest is really um, whether variation in the gut uh, microbial community uh, is related to personality. I thought that was, you know, kind of interesting. Um, and uh, so these are the, you know, these are the personality um, attributes of the, the big five. Uh, and then a bunch of other, like this is diet, uh, gluten-free, um, probiotic foods, um, supplements. Uh, this is uh, health and lifestyle. Um, and uh, yeah, and sort of some of the uh, socio-demographic characteristics. And then what is shown here is explained variance in the composition. Right? So not surprisingly, you see that diet, um, you know, have very high uh, 
uh, significance levels of explained variance. Of course, the explained variance is quite small. Um, and then other analysis that sort of tells you uh, what what direction uh, this goes this goes in. So, I mean, basically, they find that the personality traits really do not explain much of the variation in the gut composition. It is associated with some of the the alpha um, diversity, which is the the diversity of the of the gut for the individual. Um, but you know, you find that like an adventuresome eater, um, prebiotic foods that increases the diversity of the gut microbiome. Um, lifestyle is important. Those who travel broadly have a more diverse microbiome. Uh, sleep quality is really important and increases diversity. Um, uh, so poor sleep is less diverse and more altered um, composition. Stress and anxiety is associated with less diverse microbiomes and then, and then poor health. Um, you know, I think that the problem, and I was actually talking with uh, Conrad uh, last night about the microbiome when we were on our delayed flight, which arrived uh, at, um, after midnight, um, that it's really hard to sort out the direction here. So this is a very, you know, we're really in the nascent stages of understanding the importance of the microbiome uh, for health. We know it's important, but, you know, obviously when you're sick, you're going to um, probably not, buy, not uh, have a very diverse diet, not have a very diverse microbiome. When you don't have a uh, diverse microbiome, that um, is less healthy. So um, I think there's a lot to be done in the future here. Okay. okay. So future opportunities for social genomics research, and I'm just going to mention a couple and then quit. Um, you know, I think that, you know, we're really at a place where um, we can, you know, engage in some multi-omics modeling, you know, integrating the different omics data to understand how the social environment affects health and behavior through the genomic pathways and networks and interactions. Um, combining you know, the genomics, epigenomics, and transcriptonomics can maybe uncover some of these mechanisms that control phenotypes. Um, and I don't know, I mean, off the top of my head, uh, for example, um, in, in interactions between polygenic scores and epigenetic age um, uh, could show when epigenetic age um, becomes especially important for outcomes or how gene expression uh, mediates epigenetic processes. We're actually starting to look at that in, uh, that's one of, one of the, the goals of our um, epigenetic um, grant, um, which is, you know, sort of understanding um, how uh, a uh, developing and uh, allostatic load sort of um, cluster um, of genomic uh, markers is related to mental health and cardiovascular health and how it might be um, mediated by um, gene expression. I mean, all these data are not, um, in that health are not yet available, but by, by um, next year, they will be. And then I just want to mention uh, another uh, source in, in that health. Um, that will in the future become available for some really interesting work, and that's the Ad Health Parent Study. So, um, you know, we we interviewed the parent in wave one. They were these are the baby boom parents. They were average age forty five. They had adolescent kids, um, and then twenty to twenty five years later, we've we've followed them up. So now these are the baby boom parents who sort of overlap a little bit with the HRS um, um, sample in terms of age, and uh, we're. Uh, hopefully going in the field to um, interview, to add um, racial and ethnic minority uh, parents so that we have a diverse sample of ad health parents. And, you know, what's interesting, I think I did this here, is, um, you know, we'll, we'll be in the field at the same time as, you know, like wave five and, and wave six. Um, and so we really tried to take advantage of that by harmonizing uh, the measures that are being taken from the baby boom parents who are now between the ages of about 65 to 80 and the ad health respondents who are now, you know, be, this is like wave five and wave six between 33 uh, and 49. And so we've, ha we've harmonized the cognitive measures that we're going to take on both parents and their kids. Uh, we've harmonized some of the contextual measures. And we also are very excitingly harmonizing the genomic data. 
So we're going to collect um, DNA on the parents, so we have it on the kids, and methylation data on the parents. Um, so we'll have that for two generations. Um, we also have a unique sample of about 250 trios, so that allows for some special um, uh, nurture analyses. And because we're adding the, um, you know, all of the uh, African American and Hispanic uh, parents, or the parents of African American and Hispanic adolescents, um, we should have sufficient sample size for understanding the racial and ethnic uh, disparities in these intergenerational linkages. So that is the story of Ad Health and its genomic data. Um, you know, Ad Health has had a huge impact. Um, as Jason mentioned, we've really um, made a huge commitment to get the data out into the scientific community that, um, for the most part, results in a good. <laughs> I was talking to Jason Lee um, that. It has, uh, you know, been a challenge um, because when you make data available to researchers who do not always have all the, the training and the information um, and, and the skill to work with um, interdisciplinary data, data they're not used to, sometimes that results in not the best research. <clears throat> and especially the candidate gene data, when we released that, you know, we had a, uh, we thought long and hard about how to release it, um, how to, you know, help people understand what these data are and how to use it. And we decided at that time to rely on the peer review process. Um, and, you know, it doesn't, didn't always work that well. Uh, and, you know, worried me quite a bit. I, I used, I have, I used to have some slides on genetic research that, that talks about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, what I've shown you today is always falls into the good for the most part. There is a lot of ugly <laughs> uh, data that came out, but you know, I decided that in the early nascent stages, um, there was always going to be bad data. We've seen it in other fields, not just social genomics. Um, and eventually, there is a process that lifts up the level where the good rises up. And I think that, you know, that I think that has definitely happened. Um, I also have um, been able to serve as reviewers and consultants on, uh, on, ma on many geneticists who use social data uh, in, 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 you know, very um, uh, inaccurate ways. So it works both ways. And, um, you know, we are committed to, to getting, getting this data out and having as many people attend these types of conferences and workshops so you can uh, learn how to use it. Uh, here's our co-funders and information for access. Thanks, I don't know if I was supposed to leave time for questions. Okay. Can I just quickly check, can non-US people use this data? Yes. We, yes, we have a, we have a map of our users and it's around the globe. Yeah, another quick question. I'm not sure whether you mentioned it. Uh, so the wave six, uh, when are you, so it's in the in fields, then when are you expecting to release it? Yeah, um, I was going to say, people have questions about wave six, you can uh, come up to me afterwards. But wave six is in the field right now. Um, and these data, they'll be in the field through 2024. So the expectations is that it will be released in 2025. I'm using adherence, so I'm pretty interested in uh, Good. Thank you. Yeah. And don't forget, the parent data, that, that grant actually isn't, uh, we haven't gotten the award yet, but it looks promising for funding. So that'll be five years down the road, probably. <laughs> OK, it's Jason.
All right, welcome back everybody. So we've spent the better part of the morning and the afternoon traveling through the human genome. And now we're gonna talk about epigenetics. And when I say epigenetics, I mean a very specific type of epigenetic modification, which is DNA methylation. Uh, and DNA methylation has really grown in its popularity and its usage and application in social genomics, I think in part because of the epigenetic clocks, which many of you I'm sure have already heard of. Kathy in her uh, talk gave us a great introduction to those. Uh, so I think two of our participants are using the clocks today, two of our presenters, and uh, then Jen, who's going first, is gonna talk about, can we use DNA methylation to create surrogate biomarkers, um, and in particular, a surrogate biomarker of SES? And what does that tell us about downstream uh, morbidity mortality and also biological pathways between SES and those downstream phenotypes? Next, we have Gracie Benichuk, uh, who's gonna be talking about the effect of county level recession intensity on accelerated epigenetic aging uh, based on evidence from the 2008 recession. Thank you. Hello. I'm Gracie. Um, I'm a doctoral candidate in the sociology department here at UW. It's my great pleasure to be here today to talk to you a little bit about a project that I'm working on with Lauren about the effect of county level recession intensity on accelerated aging within the context of the Great Depression. Great Depression, Great Recession. That's your other project. So a little bit of background. Um, if you're like me, you might think recessions necessarily bad for health, but no, the literature does not necessarily say so. It's a bit more mixed. So on the one hand, we have a body of literature that suggests that recessions are in fact quite good for health. This largely comes out of economic literature. And we see that um, in some cases, cardiovascular death, traffic disease, um, and homicide decreased during the Great Recession. There was a slight decrease in alcohol consumption. And most recently, a study found that the uh, Great Recession led to a 2.3% reduction in annual age adjusted mortality, particularly, and this, this association was particularly strong amongst the elderly. On the other hand, there's also evidence that recessions are deleterious for people's health. Uh, again, specific to the Great Recession, studies have found that there was worsened mental and physical health, particularly amongst populations that we tend to think of as being marginalized or vulnerable in areas with large housing drops. There was increased mortality due to drug poisoning and unemployment shocks for middle-aged workers. So those folks that are like very close to retirement, but not quite there, which led to reduced longevity. So what do we make of these contrary findings? I think when we think of them as a whole, what it basically says is that recessions, they have heterogeneous effects. You know, it's not a one size fits all. As specifically, these effects varied within the context of the Great Recession again, by the extent of area level shock. So to what extent was an area hit hard by unemployment? How much did the housing market really drop out? And then additionally, these effects varied as a function of individual advantage. So, you know, again, for workers who were a few years shy of retirement, you know, taking that hit to their pension plan may have been particularly deleterious. Uh, people who were homeowners or members of um, particularly marginalized groups in the United States may have been hit very hard by this. So in sum, we see that the uh, Great Recession had heterogeneous effects on health, but that most of these studies, you'll notice, look at outcomes that are related to self-reported health, to mortality, um, or due to health behaviors. So we don't really know that much about how the Great Recession was embodied, whether this had consequences for epigenetic aging. We do, of course, however, already know, um, I think Jennifer already set me up for this a little bit, that um, there's a nascent body of literature that shows a, uh, growing a relationship between the social determinants of health and accelerated epigenetic aging. So for example, uh, research by Schmitz et al. found a socioeconomic epigenetic aging gradient, and there's been evidence of accelerated epigenetic aging amongst highly disadvantaged groups. We also know that there may be some story of life course timing that comes into play here. So again, um, you know, not to 
talk about Lauren's papers too much, but um, I didn't plant everybody. <laughs> it's probably was, it really was not planned. Um, <laughs> But a recent paper um, found that these, you know, looking at the Great Depression, found that these effects were particularly salient amongst people exposed, but only in utero. So this brings up that question again of whether there are other critical periods, such as these pre-retirement periods, during which epigenetic mechanisms might be equally sensitive to a large economic shock. So within this context, uh, I'm going to talk about two specific questions for our research study today. The first of which is to what extent, if any, does later life exposure to a severe recession impact epigenetic aging? And the second is how might the effect of later life recession exposure on epigenetic aging vary, if at all, by key factors such as homeownership or pension type? Here we go. Again, I won't spend too long here since we did just talk about the health and retirement study, but this is also the study that we are using um, in large part because it does have this very robust epigenetic data sample. And it has a great deal of geographic data and work around people's retirement schedules. For the purposes of our study, there were two key variables that helped us whittle down who was in our sampling frame. The first of these, obviously, was whether or not respondents had epigenetic data. There are about 4,000 people in 2016 who uh, cons consented to that process, so that's where we start. The other is whether or not you had county FIPS data, and this is because we're looking at county-level recession intensity using the housing price index, so we needed to match people's uh, location to the housing price index data. Now, this got a little spicier than I think we originally intended for it to be um, because people enter the HRS at different points. So we were able to initially match about 2,685 people in 2008 to a county FIPS location. We then had to look forward a little bit. Um, the next wave of respondents entered in 2014. And so we, after looking at how much they moved, whether they moved between other waves, were able to recover a number of other respondents by presuming that the people who came in later were probably around in the same area in 2008, they were at these later waves. So after that, and after um, discarding observations that were incomplete, you know, such as the county FIPS, where it was just the state FIPS, um, people who were missing on our controls, anyone born before 1930, because then you're really getting into a much older sample, um, and any counties that didn't happen to have housing price index data, we were left with a final sample of about 3,583 people. And I should note, we, in case you've heard this presentation of before, uh, we did also look at this for the unemployment index, but we feel that the housing price index is actually where the real story lies for this study. So that's what I'm going to focus on for the remainder of today. So the epigenetic measures that we use are uh, to the clocks, Grimage, and Dunit and Poem. Again, we've talked about these a little bit, but our choice in using them was because they're both second generation measures. They're a little bit uh, more sensitive. They have better predictive power, and they've been used frequently in studies of socioeconomic disparities and health. So our key explanatory variable is county level recession intensity. Specifically, we follow the work of Yagan and Shorn Steinberg and operationalize this variable as the change in log housing price index in a given county during the period of recession relative to the log in housing price index in the pre-recession period. And then we subtract the change in log housing price index at the national level to standardize this variable. And we end up with um, a continuous variable of recession intensity because we, first of all, don't believe that uh, this relationship is linear. And um, also following prior work, we went ahead and uh, or took quartiles from this variable and ended up with eventually just a dichotomous variable where one was equal to the quartile of most shocked counties and zero was equal to all other counties. And that choice was uh, in one part about precedent and also just about power. 
Now, while I love this variable, I actually think it's a very elegant way of measuring recession intensity. It's not very intuitive to think about. So I've also included as an example um, a what this would look like from like my home state, Colorado. So if you can look at that picture on the right, these are counties in the first quartile, so the most shocked counties. And what you can see is that over that period, we see it, that the housing price index was rising, and then around the recession, it begins to fall. So, and then in comparison, in the least shock quartiles, it's pretty flat. So this is really what we're interested in, is whether or not, uh, regardless of where you began, you really lost housing wealth. So our analytic strategy is fairly straightforward. Um, we look at um, the extent of epigenetic age acceleration in 2016 for person I in county C born in year B. Uh, recession is equal to uh, the recession intensity for county C where H is equal to one if the county is the most shock quartile and zero for all other counties. We include state fixed effects, birth year fixed effects, and a vector of covariates, including sex, race, and a number of county level pre-recession controls, such as pre-recession poverty level, whether the county was primarily dependent on manufacturing or the service industry. And finally, we stratify our models by home ownership in 2008 and pension type in 2008, since we think those are important predictive variables. So these are sample descriptives. I won't spend much time here, only to show that um, in our sample, about 45% of um, our respondents were living in the quartile of most shocked counties, which is pretty high, um, but not surprising when you think about maybe how these counties were distributed across the United States. We also had about 51% of respondents who were homeowners, and 51% uh, of respondents had no pension. So these are the results from our uh, initial findings with the full sample. As you can see, recession intensity was not significantly associated with the grim age clock in any of the models. It does move in what we would expect to be the correct direction, though. I will also note that in these tables and in all uh, future tables, these clocks are standardized. So these are in standard deviations. And then we do see for the POAM clock that um, in the initial model, and the recession intensity variable is significantly associated with accelerated age, epigenetic age, but that that um, significance is attenuated upon the addition of controls. Okay, so things get a little bit more interesting when we get into stratification, as it always does. Once again, with grim age, there are no significant relationships. However, in when we look at the POAM clock, we find that amongst homeowners in the fully controlled models, uh, living in the most shocked counties is associated with age acceleration. And this was not true, however, for non-homeowners or for any of the people who were missing homeowner status in 2008. So that would be anybody who just never reported homeowner status or who entered the uh, data set later on, just to, to be clear about who those people are. We find similar sorts of findings for the uh, pension questions. It's you know, a little bit of a bummer with pension because the defined benefit sample is so tiny, it's really hard to make much of that. But when it comes to the defined contributions or the combination pension, which and the combination is just you are, have both defined benefits and defined contributions, we do see that for grim age, um, living in the most shocked quartiles was associated with accelerated epigenetic aging. And that for POAM, similarly, it was associated with accelerated epigenetic aging and it was just, just barely not significant. I think the, it was 0 0.051, so quite close, um, which you know makes again sense given that defined contributions tend to be the pension types that were hit hardest during the Great Recession. They're a little bit more of a gamble. So in summary, we examine the effect of county level recession intensity on epigenetic aging for two clocks and uh, looked 
for this study, or for this presentation, primarily uh, at the housing price index. And what we find is that among homeowners and persons with more precarious pension types, living in counties whose housing price indices experienced the greatest shock during the recession was associated with accelerated epigenetic aging outcomes. And what's interesting to me in particular is that the POEM clock seems to be particularly sensitive too, which given that we know grim age is more closely associated with mortality and POEM is more closely associated with uh, biological deterioration, um, this suggests that it might not necessarily kill you to experience that shock, but that it might lead to um, increased morbidity in later life, which is particularly from a demographic perspective, a problem, not great. Um, we don't want people to be sick. Um, this also reflects the narrative that the Great Recession was particularly deleterious to the middle class, the fact that we see this effect amongst homeowners and that the housing price falling, up, falling is, is so sensitive. And finally, this suggests that the stress of significant asset loss can be embodied and have long-term implications for people's health, even years later. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you to the social genomics group and to the uh, people who attended IGSS last fall. I know there are a few of you here. For all your feedback, it really helped us move this forward. And I look forward to your comments and questions. And finally, we have uh, Kyle Barasa. Did I say that right? Barasa uh, from Duke University, who's going to be talking about treatable health conditions during adolescence and accelerated aging at midlife. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm excited to be here and talk to you all. Um, so I'm going to be talking uh, about adversity and health across lifespan and talking about the role of accelerated biological aging. Uh, so I am a senior fellow at the Duke uh, Aging Center, as well as currently working at the Durham VA, so I sort of span those two worlds. I'm a clinical psychologist, so what I'm primarily interested in is thinking about how stress might be associated with health, with the end goal of hoping to intervene to improve health as people age. This comes at sort of the meeting place of my training, so thinking, you know, as a clinical psychologist, but then also in terms of gerontology, broadly speaking, so as people move across the lifespan, how things change, both socially and genomically, and uh, most importantly, their health as they get older, uh, and bringing in social epidemiology as a way to get at this as well. Uh, and so, I, yeah, I always have this moment where, you know, at the, at the end of the day, I'm the last talk, and I wish I could have changed some of what I'm going to talk about, but just to to sort of open with the idea of what I'm trying to do is bring the kind of work that you all are doing and bringing it into integrated medical settings in order to intervene and make a difference in the health of the people on the ground. Uh, I very much focus on mechanisms and particularly treatable mechanisms. So a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about today is thinking about uh, some of this epigenetic biological aging and trying to understand what kind of treatable health conditions might be associated with that, that we could intervene on, but also thinking about where we might go in the future in order to feed this back to patients and providers in order to slow aging and improve health. So with that very long introduction, um, again, as I was talking about, my, my research is interested in trying to understand how adversity might lead to increased levels of morbidity and mortality, broadly speaking. And the way I do that is I think about psychosocial dysregulation and physiological dysregulation. When people experience adversity, you can think about childhood adversity in the form of adverse childhood experiences. You can think about trauma that people might experience across the lifespan, the kind of psychological symptoms that go along with PTSD, which develops after the experience of trauma, or even subthreshold stress that people experience, whether that might be stressful life events or the, the perceived feeling of being stressed, right? Because just because you experience a stressor doesn't mean you're gonna feel as stressed as someone else, which makes it very tricky to type, try to measure these things. Um, but this also interplays with physiological dysregulation. So just because you experience something and you feel a certain way, we wanna then tie that to physiology and and as a way to try to get at a surrogate health endpoint to hopefully know if we intervene, are we improving your outcomes? Now, as you can imagine, I've, I've done a lot of different, um, different work in terms of psychosocial dysregulation and 
physiological dysregulation associated with adversity. But the one that I've been most excited about and been working on most recently is accelerated aging, particularly measured in the epigenome, the epigenetic clocks that we've been talking about today, uh, as well as sort of the, the pace of aging, which is what that MPOM uh, epigenetic clock was actually trained on. So what I'm gonna be presenting today are some results from the Dunedin cohort. Um, so I'll get into the Dunedin cohort later, but basically I'm, I'm showing the, the actual measure that was then used to train the epigenetic clock that is then going to be exported and used in any methylation data in any other cohort. So I just want to say a bit more about biological aging as a physiological mechanism. So we have chronological age, which is essentially time since birth. And then I think about biological age as almost like time until death. That's how it's measured in some clocks, although really it's time until like health deteriorates, your body deteriorates in the ways that we expect as we get older chronologically. But we can think about accelerated biological aging as being uh, more you know, being older or younger in comparison to your physiological age or your chronological age. So as you can see here, we have a figure of the same woman who has been digitally changed to appear either younger or older. Uh, and we would expect that the woman here that is younger looking is going to actually survive longer, develop fewer chronic diseases over time. And the opposite is true of the person, the woman on the right who is older. And within sort of this new Jera science theory, the idea is that aging is the common cause of all chronic conditions that are responsible for uh, disability and death as people grow older. And so if that's associated with chronological age and biological age is a representation of that chronological age, if we can slow people's aging, hopefully we can then decrease the amount of morbidity, decrease disability, and hopefully uh, push mortality out. Uh, the end goal of this is everyone lives to be 100 in full health and then dies. And you know, basically increasing health span, not so much worried about lifespan. So I'm gonna to talk today about just some, some results I'm gonna go through quickly, starting with adolescent health conditions and biological age, then talking about stress and biological age, uh, future directions of my work, and then I didn't remove this, but I actually in the last one, so we will move on to questions after that. Um, so uh, the work I'm going to talk about today is from the Dunedin study. This is a birth cohort that has been followed from birth to age 45. This is a New Zealand cohort of 92% uh, of the people that were born in one city in New Zealand on the South Island. Uh, this started in 1972, which I mentioned because it's important to understand the, the historical context of when these people grew up. Uh, but there's about 1,037 people that have been followed over this time period, and it's been very deeply phenotyped, both, both in terms of mental health, but also physical health as people have gotten older. Uh, and some of the measures I'm going to talk about today span the lifespan. So childhood and adolescent measures of mental health, obesity, smoking, and adverse childhood experiences. In adulthood, we have uh, stressful life event counts, uh, perceived stress, as well as trauma and measures of PTSD. And then at midlife, these are gonna be the measures of aging and biological aging. Now, again, these are actual measurements of biological aging, but these have now been ported out into the epigenetic measure Dunedin PACE, which is being applied in different cohorts, but also uh, just to put a plug out there, you can go on the eLife paper from Be Belsky et al. If you have your own CPG data, you can literally you know, port this out with one line of R code. Uh, so, uh, the midlife uh, aging measures I'm going to talk about are facial age, pace of aging, gait speed, and brain age. So for this first study, we were, I was interested in what treatable adolescent health conditions might be associated with accelerated aging in midlife. So if you can imagine, if we can understand which types of treatable health conditions in adolescence are going to be predictive of accelerated aging in midlife, those might be the things that we want to intervene on earlier in the lifespan to hopefully prevent ill health from ever developing later. But to do that, we need to know what, what do we actually intervene on? And so for this sample, it's a 910 people from that Dunedin birth cohort. And the treatable health conditions we looked at were obesity, smoking, and having a mental health condition. Uh, and those mental health conditions, there were four of them, conduct disorder, uh, ADHD, um, depression, and anxiety interestingly measured with DSM-3, because that was when this study was conducted. DSM-3 was what was, in, um, what was in use at the time. 
And the midlife biological aging measures were um, a factor derived from four measures of biological age. So the pace of aging, again, not the epigenetic measure, but the actual like 19 biomarkers measured over four time points and latent trajectories within that cohort. Some people are aging faster, some people are aging slower than might be expected across a given portion of time. Um, brain age, which is uh, a structural fMRI measure that's used to uh, define whether people's brains appear older or younger than their chronological age. Gait speed, which believe it or not is a great measure of people's uh, biological age. And then facial age, uh, which is essentially just how old does a naive coder think you are? And so uh, the data I'm showing you here uh, take a midlife aging factor score. So this is going to be basically standard deviation unit differences. And these are going to be for people, and in this case, adolescents, who then go on to, we're showing data from when they're 45 years old, with zero health conditions, one con of these conditions, or uh, comorbid conditions. And what you can see is as, as you have more of these uh, treatable health conditions, you're aging at a faster rate. You have a, a, a more, like, older age at age 45. So presumably, if we can intervene on these things, we're going to slow aging and improve people's health if these things are reversible. And so I'm going to break this down a bit into each of these four measures, then I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these individual conditions. So uh, first, let's break it down by the four. Okay. Let's break it down by the four measures of aging. As you can see, this sort of stepwise association is present across each of these measures of aging. So again, it's not being driven by sort of one of these measures or another. It's, it's something we're seeing across each of these. But more interestingly to me, can we think about um, in terms of mental health and biological age, what is it that, that is actually driving this effect I just showed you? So in this case, again, we're showing midlife aging, and then this is going to be bivariate associations, controlling for sex, and then controlling for childhood health, socioeconomic status, and adverse childhood experiences for smoking, obesity, and mental health. And so just in the bivariate models, you can see the, there, there's accelerated aging for each of these treatable health conditions. I don't think any of us are surprised that smoking as an adolescent or being obese as an adolescent is associated with accelerated aging later in life. But I just want to point out that having a mental health condition is showing a sizable effect as well. And this effect remains when you control for some of the child uh, covariates that might be you know, explaining this association. Um, and when it comes to the, the size of this effect in particular, I think it's important to think about base rates. So again, this was a cohort from the 70s. So that smoking number is going to go down in terms of the amount of adolescents who are smoking. That's just sort of a, an effect that we know is going on. Obesity, in comparison, has increased and skyrocketed. So, and that's showing the strongest association. So that's probably, and I mean, this is being reflected in the public health push to try to address childhood obesity. Um, but also look at the number of uh, adolescents with a mental health condition. Uh, the burden of a mental health condition might not be as high as these other two uh, types of, of treatable health conditions, but the N of the group that's going to experience this is much larger. And so that might be a bigger group, a bigger at-risk group that we could intervene on to improve health later. Uh, so I'm going to move to a different study, which uh, is, came out just a couple months ago. And in this case, we we're interested in, well, what might be the types of stressors that might be associated with, in this case, the pace of aging, just that one measure from the Dineen study using 19 biomarkers measured across four occasions that is used to derive the Dineen pace epigenetic measure. And so um, what you're seeing here is uh, people who have high perceived stress, high number of stressful life events, high number of adverse childhood experiences, and a PTSD diagnosis as well uh, on the y-axis, the additional months of aging per year that they have compared to the average person in the cohort. Um, I'm using these four measures because these are things that you could actually measure when someone comes into your clinic. Uh, people like to poo-poo retrospective measures, which we have prospective measures in this cohort of ACEs, but like I am never going to be able to measure someone's ACEs prospectively when I bring them in for a clinical visit. So these are all things that you could assess, or a doctor, a provider, any kind of uh, public health official could assess in the moment. And what we see is that there is an association, again, a bivariate association controlling for sex, 
in which there's accelerated aging for people who have high levels of perceived stress, high number of stressful life events, a high number of ACEs, and a PTSD diagnosis. Um, each of these is attenuated somewhat when you put them into the same model. And the thing that I think is interesting here is the perceived, uh, perceived stress, which is the perceived stress scale. It's, you can do it in four items or you can do it in 10 items. It's self-report, but it has these kinds of large effects. And how do I know it's a large effect? Well, let's compare it to the effect of smoking. And you can see here that these associations are showing uh, a level, a size of an effect that's similar to smoking, which again, for me as a provider, that's the thing I'm always imagining. If I can stop someone from smoking, I know I'm gonna improve their health. So maybe there's an opportunity here to think about treating mental health as a way to slow people's aging in order to uh, improve their health as they age. Uh, just a little bit more from this. Um, this is just looking at, again, this is comparing the folks that have no trauma in this group to those that have trauma but no PTSD, to those that have PTSD and must have then had a trauma because you must have a trauma in order to have PTSD, um, but past PTSD and then current PTSD. And what you see is a stepwise association such that experiencing trauma is going to, is associated with a faster rate of aging. So is having past PTSD, but having current PTSD seems to be associated with the fastest aging. Again, let's put in current smoking, and that's where we can sort of benchmark our effect to think, yeah, yes, this is something that's going to be particularly relevant to, to health. Um, and so where this sort of, I think about this intersecting with the work that's been talked about today is the, as I've mentioned before, the way that this pace of aging measure has now been ported out into the Dunedin Pace Epigenetic Measure of Aging. Um, as I mentioned, I'm at the VA, and so we don't have a well-characterized clinical cohort that we've followed for 20 years. And by the time we followed a veteran cohort for 20 years, we've lost the opportunity to intervene on this big cohort of early to midlife folks that went to war in Afghanistan and Iraq. So if you'd imagine this 2000 to like well, three years ago cohort is the largest cohort that's going to move through the VA currently as the older cohorts of Vietnam veterans moves out. But there's an opportunity here, hopefully, to intervene before they reach middle and older age in order to hopefully slow their aging and improve their health. And so um, what I'm gonna be working on, uh, I start a position July 1st where I'm gonna be uh, using a career development award to look at Dunedin Pace epigenetic aging in a cohort of 2,300 veterans who um, completed a number of surveys, but most importantly to me, got assessed for recurrent or past PTSD uh, and looking at the rates of aging in that cohort in terms of um, those who have current PTSD, past PTSD, or no PTSD. And most excitingly, the VA is the largest integrated healthcare system in the world, and they have an electronic medical record that's shared across this huge medical system. And we have permission to go in and use the medical record for the folks that, uh, that we have this Dunedin Pace measure on. So we'll actually be able to look forward and say, what are we seeing in terms of the chronic health conditions they're developing over time? So over the next five years, over the next 10 years, how are their biomarkers changing? Because whenever they come into primary care, they're getting their blood pressure taken, they're getting their BMI measured, they're getting their heart rate taken, um, and actually pain as well, which would be particularly interesting in this group. Um, and then are they going on to develop the chronic health conditions we might expect them to? Uh, and is PTSD sort of, is that, might this be a way we could understand that PTSD is influencing health with the opportunity, hopefully, to intervene? Um, and I'll just end by saying, I always feel like, you know, is this a causal effect? Is it not a causal effect? At some level, uh, I don't necessarily care if we can go in and intervene and can show in an RCT that we're changing people's aging. But until these epigenetic measures came out, there was no real way to do that. And so that's why I've been so excited by these kinds of developments that have come out recently. The ability to actually look at change in this, I think is gonna be the next frontier. And I think is the thing that's gonna have like the biggest impact on the patients and the people who, uh, who hopefully we're gonna treat and improve their health in the future. So thank you so much.